All right, here we go. All set. The November 13th, 2023 regular meeting of the Malibu City Council is now called to order. On account of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, this meeting is being held in a hybrid format that allows members of the public to participate in person or remotely via Zoom webinar. In-person participants, if you'd like to speak, please submit your request to speak to form to our clerk over here on my right. Remote participants, if you would like to speak, please join the Zoom meeting, Zoom webinar meeting, print it on the agenda, and raise your hand in Zoom when the item you wish to speak on is called. Kelsey, can we have a roll call? Let's see who's here. Councilmember Grisanti. Here. Councilmember Riggins. Here. Councilmember Silverstein. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart. Here. Mayor Uring. Yes, here. You have a quorum. Okay, any speaker cards we have? Nobody's here to speak. No, we have you, not received uh, injuries like as speak? speaker slip for the closed session. We have not received any speaker slips for the closed session, and we don't not have do not have any raised hands no or hands participants online. on Zoom. Okay, we will now recess to a closed session to discuss the items listed on the closed session agenda. We'll reconvene here at six thirty to begin the regular meeting and hear a closed session report. Thank you very much.
Mic test, one, two, three, four, five. Mic test six, <laughs> seven, eight,
be so clever. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the November 13th, 2023 regular meeting of the Melville City Council is now called to order. On account of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, this meeting is being held in a hybrid format that allows members of the public to participate in person or remotely by a Zoom webinar. In-person participants, if you'd like to speak, please submit your request to our city clerk on my right. Remote participants, if you'd like to speak, please join the Zoom webinar meeting, print it on the agenda, and raise your hand when the item you wish to speak on is called. Kelsey, can we have a roll call? Let's see who's here. Councilmember Grisanti. Here. Councilmember Riggins. Here. Councilmember Silverstein. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart. Here. Mayor Uring. Here. You have a quorum. Uh, Pledge of Allegiance. My friend, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Go. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. May we please have a closed session report? I don't know who's going to give that. I, I can still give it. Okay. And inform. So at uh, 6 o'clock p.m., the City Council met in open session and then recessed to closed session for the item listed on the posted agenda. All five council members were present and no reportable action was taken. Thank you very much. Uh, report on a posting of the agenda, Kelsey. The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on November 3rd, 2023. I need a motion to approve the agenda. I'll make, I'll, a, I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. I'll second it. Okay, I'd like to wait, make one adjustment if, if, if it's your, if your uh, request. We were going to do a proclamation for Dick Van Dyke here this evening. Uh, and Dick can't make it today. Uh, so I'd like to have that item moved to our next meeting, the 27th, when Dick will be here and we can do the proclamation uh, as we should. So if I can get a agreement to do that. I agree to a friendly amendment on that. I agree to it as well. Okay, do we need a roll call, Kelsey? Give us a roll call. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Uri? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, very good. Uh, we've got no ceremonial presentation, so let's move to written and oral communications from the public. Do we have any speaker slips, please? We do. And just as a general rule, once a motion has been, or an item has been called, in the agenda, we're going to quit taking speaker slips. So just if you want to speak, you got to make sure you get it in here ahead of time. All right. So Jill Hawkins, who is first, followed by Keegan. You here? You're next. So guys, grab a seat up front. Oh, cool. Please go ahead. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, hope you guys are all having a good evening. I'm here to represent kids that are being denied school in Malibu, Santa Monica, and across the state of California. In 2015, they took away our personal and religious exemptions to opt out of um, the vaccines to go to school. So now kids are being segregated and discriminated based on vaccination status. So I think we all the common sense. Um, so I'm asking you guys to help me to get these kids back in school because, you know, we're all talking about equity, inclusion and diversity. So we need to include everyone. I think products need to work for the person who's choosing to use them. I think it's silly to expect people to take a vaccine that has aluminum, formaldehyde, aborted fetal cells, animal DNA and many chemicals to have to use a product um, and not to have the right to have natural immunity, like measles. I'm sure a lot of you guys all had measles up there um, before is 1962, 1963 when they introduced the vaccine. Um, the death rate in 1962 is one in 500,000. So kids are being denied school. So kid, like kids with HIV and hepatitis B have a right to go to school as they should, uh, and they're carrying an active virus, but kids who are not taking a vaccine for hepatitis B, um, who are not carrying an illness are being denied school. So anyway, we have, um, unfortunately, we have pharmaceutical interests going to our capital and um, taking away our personal religious exemptions. Every state has always had exemptions from the beginning of time. And about in 2015, that's when they started going from state to state. And now six states are um, took away our exemptions. So kids here in, in our city are being denied school. So anyway, I'm just also sharing a book because um, this kind of shows you know, what's going on in, you know, in our 
they're influencing our politicians up at the Capitol. It's called The Real Anthony Fauci, Bill Gates, Big Pharma, and the Global War on Democracy and Public Health by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. So anyway, I hope we can all work together if, and get our kids back in school. And, um, you know, because when there's a risk, there must be a choice. I work with a lot of vaccine injuries and deaths with families all around the world and around the country and in California and here in our city of uh, Santa Monica, Malibu. So anyway, I'm hoping that maybe we can all uh, reach out to Ben Allen, Senator Allen, and ask him to introduce a bill and to give us our religious exemptions back. Because um, again, we must, you know, my body, my choice, and we should all have a right to not inject you know, foreign matter in our body and have the right to natural immunity. So anyway, I give you guys all a book, one of these books, and I hope you'll take a look at it and maybe t take a look at Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s running for president. Joe, thank you very much. Keegan, you're up and behind. Is Tim Perra here? Come on up, Tim. Grab a seat up first? front so we can keep it moving. Sure. Okay. Evening, everybody. Um, so about 20 years ago, two good friends of mine, uh, Keith and Tyler, died on PCH, driving a motorcycle down towards Santa Monica, got um, a T-boned a car that did an illegal U-turn uh, right at the beach at sunset. And I mean, shortly after, they put paddles up, but... Uh, you know, obviously it was a little bit too late. So ever since then, I've kind of had this, uh, I don't know, yearn to want to do something. And when the Pepperdine uh, tragedy happened, a, a great group of people led by Gen C2 um, kind of coalesced to do something. So um, tomorrow and on the 19th, uh, there'll be two events down at Webway and PCH. And we're building a memorial um, for all the people that have died since Emily Shane was tragically killed in 2010. So from 2010 till the four Pepperdine girls uh, that were killed last month, uh, there's been 58 deaths on PCH. So um, we'll be uh, doing a memorial, one tire for every death. That'll be down there at Webway and PCH. And um, I want to thank Steve, Doug, uh, Richard Mollica, and Rob Debo over there. Uh, for really helping make this happen and really uh, expediting what I thought would never happen. So um, thank you guys. And again, it's tomorrow evening's kind of the kickoff for it. It's at 5 p.m. And then on the 19th, I believe it's uh, 9 a.m. If you go to fixpch.org, there's a sign up and all the information's on there. So fixpch.org will have a kind of a bunch of updates and everything. You can sign up for email and stuff. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. So thank all your team. I know this has been a group effort that you guys have put together. So yeah, I don't, I, I don't want to take credit at all. I mean, Jen's kind of coalesced this group, but yeah. um, Tina's here. She'll also speak about it. But cool. uh, yeah, thank I just you. want to bring some more. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank Be you good. Guys. All right. Uh, Tim, you're up. Tina, you're following him. So good evening, Mayor and respectful city council members. Can I get Funny. one of those hats? Huh? <laughs> no, go ahead. I had to bring the hat. <laughs> I'm just um, going to give out the uh, MRCA Ranger report from last last month. During the last month, a total of 15 administrative citations were issued. Ten administrative sites were issued at Lachusa Beach for dogs on the beach and possession of alcohol and smoking violations. Also, overnight fire patrols were implemented during the red flag wind events at all of our parks. Uh, luckily, no fire incidents occurred. Four administrative sites were also issued at Escondido Canyon Trail for dogs off leash and illegal off trail use in the back country. During the weekends, additional rangers were staffed in Malibu to address the high volume of park visitors in all of our parks. No homeless encampments were observed at Malibu Bluffs or any of our other parks. A total of 249 parking citations were issued. And that concludes my report. Thank you very much. Tim, thank you. Any questions for Tim? Any questions? So I asked the last time how many extra rangers you have. So um, just to be clear, you have just a standard amount of rangers, which is how many? And then when you have extras, how many extra? We try to staff at least five during the uh, red flag events at night, and they're all night. They're 24-hour uh, patrols throughout. Okay. So remember I told you that it was three. Mm -hmm. Now we try to staff as much as at least five rangers. And they're patrolling uh, on foot or just in vehicle? 
in vehicles, and also we do foot patrol on our trails in the backcountry, okay. like es Escondido and uh, Corral Great. Canyon. Yeah. Thank Jim, you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm Thanks, sorry. Jim. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. One, one quick question. You say you've got five rangers. Are they just from Malibu, or are they at your other parks? Good question. Uh, they're, they're roaming, so they're all throughout Malibu, up to Topanga Canyon, Tuna Canyon, and then they'll hit Mul Mulholland Corridor. So they're, they're roaming all night, 24-7. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. Uh, wait, I have a couple questions. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, the citations that were issued, um, mm -hmm. are they issued on um, MRCA property, or are they issued elsewhere? They're... The ones that I reported are our, our MRCA property. So all the cars that were got parking citations, it was for parking on MRCA property? Correct. The ones I reported tonight. Okay, thank you. you well, wait, wait, wait a minute. Are there others that you issue that aren't on MRCA property? Oh, no, in other parks, but okay. the, the report is for Malibu only. Got it. Thank <laughs> you. Okay. okay, any other questions? Tim, thank you very much. You're welcome. Have a good night. Thank you, sir. Tina, you're up next, followed by Josh Spiegel. Hi again. <laughs> um, just want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to the council and want to thank you guys for all you've been doing the last few weeks to help us um, with this um, fixing PCH. Uh, my family's been homeowners. Uh, on PCH for, can I do that? Yeah. Oops, sorry. No, I can't. Okay. My family have been homeowners on Pacific Coast Highway for 50 years. And as kids, we used to walk to Toys and Sports and Hickory Burger. I don't know if you remember that. And, you know, we would walk there and back and it was easy, but things have changed since then. Uh, all through the night and day, we now hear trucks and cars whizzing past the house at speeds of 80, 90 and more. And October 17th was horrific. The loss of these four beautiful young women struck a chord like no other, and I just can't stop thinking about them. I can't stop thinking that they had their whole lives ahead of them, and that they were simply walking to a party, laughing and excited to have a night off from studying, talking about what they were gonna do after graduation, and then in a blink of an eye, their lives were just snuffed out. They didn't know they only had one more minute of life on this earth. As Keegan said, at five o'clock tomorrow night, Four white tires like this will be placed on the corner of Webway and Pacific Coast Highway. Um, I can and never will know the agony of the families of these young women and all the families that have lost loved ones on PCH. Um, and I used to call these accidents, but they aren't accidents. They're car crashes. They're the result of speeding drivers, careless drivers, drunk drivers, angry drivers. They are crimes. But in true Malibu spirit, our community has come together. A huge thank you to all of you who have helped us. A huge thank you to Sean from the Tire Man in Thousand Oaks who donated 58 tires, which will be painted white and displayed as a memorial to those who have died on PCH in the last 13 years since Emily was killed. Uh, Reef Anawalt from Anawalt Lumber donated spikes, paint, tarps, gloves, masks, and most of all, his time uh, helping create this memorial. <laughs> Caltrans, stop the tragic deaths on PCH. Why has nothing been done in the last 13 years? PCH is your responsibility. I've always said actions speak louder than words. Caltrans, it's time to act. We are only asking for you to do your job, to fix PCH and make the road safe. We need short-term, mid-term, and long-term solutions. There are actions that could be taken tomorrow. Two years ago, a fence was taken down by the MRCA without assessing potential safety issues or an environmental impact report. The city, thank you, agreed to fast track an over-the-counter permit to put the fence back up to protect the public. It's one of the most dangerous sections of PCH, Dead Man's Curve at La Costa Beach. And now that the fence is down, it's a blatant invitation for visitors to park and run across the highway with their children and picnic baskets in tow. Every day I see people park, open their doors, step into the highway, getting Thank their children out of their car with trucks. Thank you, Tina. Your time's up. Yep. So thank, thank you, you very for your, much. Thank you for your time. Okay, Josh, you're up, followed by Joe Drummond. Am I good? Yep, you're on. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm here tonight to avoid doing bedtime 
Um, <laughs> yeah, he wrote that. Yeah. Um, no, I'm here tonight to talk about something that I firmly believe in. Um, there's a few main things that, that we care about in Malibu the most, right? Is public safety, schools, parks, and the environment. Um, I, I feel like we're, we've kind of lost track of what we're doing on the parks. You know, we have people coming in all the time. We, you know, you hear from Bill Sampson, you hear from others about the pool, you hear from um, others about field space. Um, we're not really making progress. And it was, you know, four or five years ago, I think it was Mikey talking about, we have a bandwidth problem in Malibu. Um, we had Woolsey with pandemic. The, we're basically through these things. And now's the time to really put our foot forward and move forward. Um, I've been speaking to a couple uh, Parks and Rec commissioners, and they're telling me that um, we're going to do another community survey. Why? We did one five, six years ago. We know what we need, right? We need a pool. We need field space. We have the money. We have the space. Let's just do that. Let's do it. The other thing that's kind of bugging me is five years ago, we had a skate park ready. It's ready to be approved. We had the money, we had the design, we have the contractor, and now there's story pulls up, up there. I, I mean, I, I don't. I think we're adding a bathroom. I don't. I don't know why we're adding a bathroom. We should have done the old two-step. You know, build the park and then add the bathroom later. Two-step works really well. Ask the developers, right? Um, one other thing I wanted to touch on before I just kind of move on. If you go up there Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. You can't find a parking space. You know, I like to go up there, eat lunch, and I've just been blocking uh, Mr. Gillen's little access there because there's nowhere else to park because he parks all his guys in the parking lot along the street, and I just really hope that, that y'all could do something. Um, so I'm here tonight to urge you, hey, let's get away from this survey. Let's not do it. Let's move forward and do something about these parks, okay? It's not really that complicated. Let's just make a decision and run in that direction, even if it's 100 miles in the wrong one. Let's just pick a direction and go. Thank you. Guys, thank you very much. Very good. Joe, you're up, followed by Lloyd. And Joe, you've got four minutes from Andonine, from and right? I can't believe I almost agree with everything Josh Spiegel just said, but I do. Anyway, Honorable City Council, Oh, and I am going to be attending the PCH task force meeting, which I think everybody should attend tomorrow so that we can get CHP back full time on the state's dime, not ours. So anyway, although Mayor Pro Tem Stewart and I plan on discussing this privately, I wanted to go on the record that to say that appointing local contractor Drew Leonard to the Planning Commission is an unfortunate mistake. I urge Council Member Stewart to reconsider. People have gone on record by sending in complaints of his abuse to the city. Drew Leonard's big buck bulldoze at all costs approach to development is making people ang angry. Here are a couple of examples. One, he cozies up to planning decision makers so that while many actual fire victims like the Zelinskis family have had to wait for five years to get a permit so far, Leonard has been going around calling himself a rebuild expert, bragging that he had an in with the city allowing him to fast track projects. His first project on Paseo Canyon Drive received the very first rebuild permit in the city. Just as soon as Leonard's construction company had it completed, causing a nightmare for his neighborhood architectural committee, apparently, he quickly sold it and pocketed more than $1.1 million. Immediately, he repeated the process. He bought a burnt out lot on the same street within a few weeks, and he quickly did a rebuild on a property that is now worth three and a half times as much. Even though he was not an actual fire victim himself, he continued getting permits for his fire sale rebuild projects. Why are he and other fire rebuild profiteers being prioritized over the victims who escape with just the clothes on their backs? Two, City Council Member Karen Ferrer also purchased a burnout property at 624 Bush Drive in an environmentally sensitive habitat area. Under city law, she was entitled to a rebuilt permit allowing a new structure to be 10% larger than the original. Instead, she increased her home size by 40%, adding an unpermitted second story. 
Instead of finding her to be in violation of city regulations, Leonard publicly attacked and intimidated the Malibu residents who called for the city to enforce the CDP requirements, code violations, and fees. Leonard believes cutting corners is perfectly fine for developers who have friends in high places. Three, members of Leonard's own neighborhood HOA never allowed him to be on their board. Why? They did not want him to change their neighborhood character, their rural character. Even though his own neighbors could see this in him, and even though people reported the issues to the city and state, sadly he was approved as a planning commissioner. And then I just heard that he might have a financial extension to not disclose his financial holdings. I don't know if this is true or not, but if, that, if that's the case, what is he trying to hide? Last month, the former chair of the California Fair Political Practices Commission, Anne Ravel, wrote a letter to the city pointing out flagrantly unfair potential conflicts of interest on the Malibu Planning Commission. She noted that two of its five members were local contractors who could approve projects on which later they would be able to make bids for their professional work should they want to do that. And now, Drew Leonard's appointment to the commission makes him the third local contractor of the five total seats. To appoint him really is a slap in the face of the FPPC. Does Malibu really want every project to be returned to the Planning Commission nullified and reversed when the FPPC issues a ruling in favor of Ann Ravel and Malibu residents? That could cost the city millions of dollars in time and money. I asked Mayor Pro Tem Stewart if you will consider the complaints against Drew Leonard as well as the character issues and remove him as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Lloyd, you're up. You know, somehow I was mistaken. I thought Sam Hall Kaplan was a man. This is unbelievable what just went on. Um, good evening, council members. My name is Lloyd Ahern, and I am the representative of Malibu to the, of Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy. And I was going to report on this last week, but it was inappropriate because of the tragedy that we were dealing with. But... I got a, during the meeting, Joe told the, the whole uh, Santa Monica Mountains board that they were going to bring two fire engines to Malibu. And it seemed a little clunky to me when I was hearing about it because it wasn't described well in the agenda. And then, and I was thinking to myself, I wonder what he's going to, where is he going to put these fire engines? Well, he decided to tell me, and not he did not refer to me by my name. He refers to everybody by their name on the board. And he said, the representative from Malibu, would you please tell the powers to be that it's going to be at Bluffs Park? So we should be aware of what Joe's intentions are. He wanted me to tell you, I'm telling you, and we better be uh, up for it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. Uh, Kelsey, any hands? There are four raised hands. First is Jenny Rusenko. I'm go here. Ahead. Can you hear me okay? Got you. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Good evening, City Council. Uh, my name is Jenny Rusenko, and I'm sorry that I couldn't be there in person. Um, but I am here to address the issue of our city's wireless ordinance. I hope you've had time to read the letter from our attorney, W. Scott McCullough, that was sent to the Environmental Sustainability Department, the Planning Department, and to all of you. If not, please do read that letter as it is extremely important. Unfortunately, in the two plus years since our wireless ordinance was unanimously passed by City Council, City staff has not been following the fire safety protocol explicitly required for wireless installations and upgrades that was required by our ordinance. This puts our entire community at risk and having just passed the five year anniversary of Wolsey, I know we're all very highly aware of how at risk we are when it comes to fire. Uh, we have been asking for over two years to be put back on the city council agenda and city staff has given us excuse after excuse not to do so. This is no longer something to ignore. Please put us back on the agenda so we can update our wireless ordinance to match the non-public right-of-way ordinance. Uh, we were prepared tonight to have dozens of people make this similar request to you during public comments, but out of respect for your time, 
I am the spokesperson for over 200 concerned Malibu residents, and I'm also personally very concerned um, having just received a pink notice of a wireless installation that is planned for within 200 feet of my home. So I'm very concerned that if the fire protocol is not followed, my family and my neighborhood here in Paradise Cove will be at even greater fire risk. Um, so just to reiterate the two action items being requested of you, please. Uh, please do read the letter that was sent to you from W. Scott McCullough to familiarize yourself with the current situation of our wireless ordinance. And then please, please put our wireless ordinance back on your agenda immediately. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you very much. Next. Lonnie Gordon. Lonnie, you're on. I'm not going to take up your time, Council. Okay. Next hand. Oh wait. I think she muted accidentally. Can you hear me now? Go ahead. Okay. I, I would just want to thank Jenny for what she had to say, and I'm not going to take your time. Uh, what she said is exactly what I would say, and all of us would say. So please take the time to read that letter, and please get the ordinance on the agenda. Thank you so much for what you do. Thank you. Thanks, Lonnie. Next, please. Jenny Root. Jenny. You there, Jenny? Jenny's unavailable. Hi. I see two devices with her name. Um, there will be feedback. Jenny, you are echoing. Jenny, do you have a phone and computer on at the same time, or? Yeah. I can't hear a word she's saying. Jenny, we yeah. hear sound coming from your microphone, but it is echoing with whatever other device you have in the room. You got to turn one of the things off, Jen. Either turn your phone off, turn your computer off, but you can't have them both go at the same time. All right, well, Jenny's working through that. Who's our next speaker? She was the last speaker. Okay. Give her another second. Let's see what happens. All right, I'm here. Can All right, Jenny. Good job. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Okay. okay. Well, I just really appreciate being able to talk to you tonight, and thank you for all the hard work that you do. Um, we just sent our daughter to Pepperdine. We would like to not worry about her safety over the next few years. And um, we just also today drove from Solano Beach through Carlsbad back home to Escondido. And as we were on that highway, they had very significant speed bumps and roundabouts slowing the traffic down. So although I support cameras on the highway, I'd rather not see a footage after an incident, but I would rather see speed bumps before an incident that work tremendously well to keep cars down to, I think, about 25 miles an hour. Okay, thank you very much. No more hands? No, those are all the raised okay, hands. Okay, very good, thank you. So we're through public comment. Uh, Commissioner or Commissioner Committee updates. Anybody online to do that, Kelsey? No, we don't have any Commissioner Committee updates. City Manager, you're on. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first thing I want to report, it looks like uh, Caltrans has been given the green light to clear out the debris uh, that uh, is um, impacting the uh, Zuma Beach undercrossing. Uh, right now they're wrapping up some uh, debris removal work around Corral Canyon. Uh, and indications are from Caltrans when they wrap up that work, uh, they will be switching to the underpass to start clearing that out. Uh, so hopefully we'll be seeing that back open in the near future. Also want to report that the um, city recently held um, evacuation drills uh, for our staff, um, whereby we had um, uh, recreated uh, or, or, or did some um, 
uh, fake scenarios in terms of both um, of both a fire escape drill and also a drill for an active shooter. I uh, want to acknowledge the assistance we, we received from both the Sheriff's Department and the Fire's Department for this drill, uh, as well as their participation in the exercise. Uh, it's important to us that we are able to protect employees and visitors in City Hall in case of an emergency, uh, and uh, I think we learned some good things through the drill. Uh, also happy to report that I recently attended a groundbreaking for the new uh, Malibu High School. I'm very excited to see the happy faces there to celebrate this project moving ahead and also wanted to appreciate the acknowledgments that we received from the school district officials on the city's efforts to partner with the district to move the project ahead. Uh, also attended the uh, business roundtable last Friday uh, where we talked quite a bit about PCH safety. Uh, let's see, last week, I uh, wanted to note that the Public Safety Department held an open house um, in recognition of the five-year anniversary of the Woolsey Fire uh, and also for Malibu's annual day of preparedness. Uh, so the Public Safety Department hosted this at uh, Malibu City Hall. Uh, community member, members were invited to meet the Public Safety staff, representatives from LA County Fire and the Sheriff's Department. We also had members from the Malibu CERT team and Ars Arson Watch. Uh, attendees learned about the city's wildfire preparedness and resiliency efforts, uh, learned about how they could get ready prepared for wildfires uh, and other activities. Also on to note, since we're at the five-year mark, um, where we're at in terms of the rebuild from Woolsey Fire. Um, uh, as of last week, we had issued 275 permits for single-family homes. Uh, 146 single-family dwellings are complete. We've issued permits for 18 multifamily buildings, uh, units, and 12 multifamily units have already been completed. Also want to announce that uh, this week uh, the city will be hosting workshops on a cultural vulnerability assessment. Uh, there will be a vir virtual workshop on November 16th. It can also be live streamed. Um, the city invites community members to participate in these upcoming workshops to learn about Malibu's coastal vulnerability assessment and the projected impacts of sea level rise associated with climate change. You can ask questions and also give input. There will be an in-person workshop on Tuesday, November 14th, that's tomorrow from 3 to 5 p.m. at Malibu City Hall, and a virtual workshop on Thursday, November 16th from 3 to 5 p.m. You can register for the virtual rec workshop uh, at the city website. Uh, city staff and uh, many of our, our elected officials have been focused quite a bit the last few weeks uh, coordinating our efforts on, on Pacific Coast Highway safety. Uh, there will be a Pacific Coast Highway Task Force meeting tomorrow here at uh, Malibu City Hall at 10 a.m. Uh, the city will be giving a presentation on what our vision is for a safe, PA, safe PCH. Uh, we will also be hearing from our state and county local elected officials, uh, Captain C2, uh, Caltrans officials, uh, so that will all be at the task force meeting uh, tomorrow here uh, in this room at 10 a.m. Uh, past few weeks I've been working with the CHP to secure proposals to bring CHP patrols back to PCH within the Malibu city limits uh, for both short and longer term duration. Uh, details have yet to be worked out, but we are looking at uh, possibly a th hopefully a three officer CHP task force which would be dedicated solely to the city of Malibu. Uh, we are working to get these contracts approved uh, to get the uh, officers on patrol as soon as we can, uh, shortly after July 1st, as soon as possible. Uh, CHP and city are working very closely together to secure these resources. Uh, and as soon as we have those contracts ready, we will bring them to the city council for their consideration. Also, I believe, we, I believe that was January 1st. You think you said July. I'm so sorry. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, no, thank you for that correction. We were trying to get those patrols started by January 1st or as soon as possible, so right after the beginning of the year. Thank you for that correction. We are not waiting until July. Um, also wanted to note, as we heard from the public speakers, that the uh, uh, Ghost Fire Memorial uh, is going to be installed here in Malibu at Webway and, Webway and PCH to honor and remember those who have lost lives on PCH. Uh, there will be a, the event tomorrow at 5 p.m., uh, followed by a dedication of the full memorial on Sunday, November 10th, excuse me, Sunday, November 19th at 10 a.m., also at Webway and PCH. I think it's at 9 a.m., I believe. Is it at 9 a.m. on the 19th? Well, we'll check those details, yeah. Mr. Mayor. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 
So assemble at nine for the 10 o'clock ceremony. Go to the website, you'll see. You got it, okay. <laughs> Thank you. So anyways, Sunday, November 19th, we'll see you there in the morning. And uh, just wanted to note, this next regular city council meeting on November 27th, that will fall the week after Thanksgiving. So just wanted to wish everybody in advance a happy Thanksgiving. Um, please note that City Hall will be closed that Thursday and Friday, November 23rd and 24th. Uh, with that, that is my report. I'll be happy to answer any questions. And I know we do have a Sergeant Sargeland as well here from the any Sheriff's Department. Any questions for the city manager? And let me thank you very much. And just for, for, I just want to supplement his comments on tomorrow's uh, PCH task force. Tomorrow we will have Ben Allen, Senator Ben Allen, Assemblymember Irwin, uh, Supervisor Horvath, we will have Sheriff Luna. We will have uh, Captain C2. We will have, I'm trying to remember who else. Somebody from Caltrans. Somebody from, Caltrans, somebody from CHP. So this is a meeting, we are serious. We are trying very hard to make some changes to improve the improve Pacific Coast Highway. Uh, so this is, that's what tomorrow's agenda looks like. Uh, right, I think that's it, all right. City Council comments. Anybody want to start? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yes, yeah, Sergeant, I apologize. No problem. He's going to ticket me going home now. There you go. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council. Um, I have the crime statistics for October, and we are still going in the right direction. So, uh, year to date, we have 390 Part 1 crimes, which again are the most serious crimes. Um, that compares with 438 uh, last year at the same time. So that is an 11% decrease uh, year over year in crime. So we are still trending in the right direction, which I'm happy to see. Um, <clears throat> continuing uh, about PCH safety. So I have a lot of uh, items to report about that. Um, last Tuesday, uh, the deputies from Lost Hill Station uh, did Operation Safe Canyons. Um, there were six of us that went out into the canyons and we patrolled um, the, uh, from the early morning hours, or I'm sorry, the late, late evening hours until the early morning hours. We issued 35 citations and 25 of those were for speed. Um, as you know, the canyons feed down into PCH and then vice versa, PCH up into the canyons. So um, we focused on the canyons uh, last week and then this week, I'm not going to say which day, but we're doing another operation, but we're going to be out on PCH, doing traffic enforcement on PCH. So look for us later this week. Um, <clears throat> there's been multiple crashes in the past two weeks as well. I'm sure you've seen on the news. Um, there was a crash at uh, County Line by Neptune's Net that involved a highway patrol officer being hit in his vehicle. Fortunately, he was okay. Um, there's been other crashes right at the side of the deadly crash with the Pepperdine students, um, almost in the exact same spot. Um, there was another crash at Decker Canyon where a car flipped over and pretty much in all these crashes, it's been inattention and speed that have been the factor. So um, people are going fast. Uh, in one incident, somebody was going through their food that they had just got and instead of paying attention to the road and didn't see the turn and then came into oncoming traffic and hit two parked cars. And another one, someone dropped their cell phone and went digging for it by their feet and instead of paying attention to driving. So in attention, I mean, we're, we're trying to, you know, crack down on PCH, we're taking a zero tolerance approach. So I uh, just wanna remind people, you know, you need to pay attention to the road while you're driving. You know, you're driving a, for all intents and purposes a four or 5,000 pound cruise missile down the highway. So. It's your responsibility to drive safely. Um, some other um, enforcement action we've been taking. Um, last week, a, one of our deputies caught a uh, local student at PCH and Webway going 101 miles an hour and arrested him for reckless driving. And uh, when I say local student, uh, he was a Pepperdine student. And you would think after what happened, they would know to slow down, but apparently not. So I met with the uh, the uh, faculty and the deans there at the university and the public safety uh, chief over there. And we're sending, we're starting an email campaign with the faculty and staff to try and educate them on the dangers of reckless driving and the slow down speed. 
Um, the city has graciously provided extra money for overtime for traffic enforcement on PCH. So um, ideally, uh, I want somebody every uh, one deputy extra every shift. But as you know, we're stretched thin. So we've hired four shifts. And in those four shifts, we've issued 12 citations for speeding. I've uh, caught two unlicensed drivers, one driver driving on a suspended license and towed three cars. And the very last shift, which was uh, Friday, or I'm sorry, Thursday last week, the deputy who was working the, the traffic enforcement detail, he caught a driver doing 80 miles an hour in a 45 mile an hour zone, approximately a half a mile from where the fatal, fatal crash was. He was also driving under the influence and he refused a chemical test. So the deputy had to get a warrant to force the blood uh, for the chemical test. And so he was arrested for DUI and reckless driving, and he was also unlicensed, so his car was impounded. So we're out there, we are cracking down, we're taking a zero tolerance approach, so um, I hope the people that live here and work here see us out there and we're making a difference and the residents see us because we're out there and we're cracking down, so. Um, also, uh, the UFO RV is gone, and I think for good that we towed that. So I don't think we'll be seeing that one anymore. And then tomorrow we are having coffee with a cop. So we're having the PCH task force in the morning. And then coffee with a cop is going to be from 1 to 3 p.m. at the uh, playground at Cross Creek at Country Mart in the center, uh, center courtyard there across from John's Garden. So uh, our plan is we're having the PCH task force, coffee with a cop, where we're going to talk about PCH safety. And then at 5 o'clock we're doing the memorial at the corner of PCH and Webway, so it'll be a one after the other tomorrow. So that's all I have, and I'm here for questions. questions. Marianne? Oh, oh, Marianne, you can, go, you can go first. I was just going to ask, um, of these drivers that you're finding doing the excessive speed and DUIs and inattention and everything else, is it a certain age group that is primarily I, I don't the offenders? Have, or? I don't have the exact figures, but... Just from what I'm seeing, it's it's younger, the younger like people. less than 25. Probably from 20 to 30s around there. Okay, so. thank you. Uh, I had someone tell me that they are wondering uh, if you're ticketed for reckless, which means you're going over 100. How 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 can we go about having that be an automatic suspension of their license? So. When you are arrested for reckless driving, so you're going to have your court case, but then you also have a DMV administrative hearing where they evaluate your license. So those are two separate entities. So the DMV can suspend your license when you get a DUI. Your license gets suspended automatically. Right. Um, and you have to petition to get it back. So um, the DMV takes an administrative look at your license, but that's separate from the, the criminal proceedings. So just reckless doesn't mean that they're going to the hearing is going to have the option of giving people a, a suspension of their license. Uh, it can. The court can actually impose a suspension, too. Um, but the DMV um, has an administrative review that they take. Would that require a change of law at a statewide level? Um, or I guess I can ask the senator. Yeah, <laughs> you, you can. Um, Gen generally, the they work hand in hand with the court system, the DMV. Okay. But they're two separate processes. Okay. Thank you. Excuse me. Just a quick question. You, you just said that a DUI can can result or will result in a suspension. Is that the citation or the conviction? Uh, so initially, if you refuse a chemical test, you're going to lose your license for a year minimum. Um, if you submit to a chemical test, which is required by law. Uh, you will have your license suspended pending a hearing with a DMV. And then they can either take your license away till the court is, case is over, or you can get a uh, restricted license to, for work and back. So they have different, different uh, outlets for you. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just a quick comment for uh, Paul's question. As I read the reports, I think about half to two-thirds of these people don't have licenses anyway. They're either suspended or they're already or don't even have one. All right. So, for the unlicensed drivers, um, I talked about it during the Public Safety Commission, but 
the district attorney has uh, instructed us to treat it as an infraction instead of a misdemeanor. So, which okay. is a ticket instead of an yeah. arrestable. You leave offense. on the side of the road, standing there with your ticket. That's what you impound the car and they're left standing. We we can't impound for unlicensed driver anymore. For reckless driving, we can't. But okay. Well, they, listen, wait, they get to drive away without a license. It's treated as an infraction, which is like a ticket. Do you follow them? Do you follow them home and give them another ticket on the way? <laughs> and then when they get back in the car to drive the rest of the way home, do you give them a third ticket? <laughs> uh, I'm looking forward to March. <laughs> Sergeant, thank you very, very much. You're welcome. I mean, you guys have done, uh, I think I, I mentioned earlier, I live right above PCH uh, and and prior, you know, prior to this whole process starting, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, PCH was a racetrack all night long, uh, and it has it has subsided su substantially. I mean, there's still every now and then here a car blowing up the, the highway, but it's a lot less than it was, and it's the effort you guys are putting in to do that. Uh, the speed task forces you send out there are making the difference. For, so I appreciate you what you're doing. Thank you, and I, I think everybody in Malibu does. It, I, I mean, a lot of emails, people are noticing the distance. Give the guy a hand, right? I mean, good. Thank you, sir. Yep, thank you. All right. Uh, council member comments. Mary Ann, you want to start off? Sure. So I attended quite a few things over the last three weeks or so. Um, the Malibu High School groundbreaking. I took part in the Malibu 5K, and uh, I think I beat my time from last year, so that was nice. And then that same day, I went up to Assembly uh, Member Irwin, had a gathering up at 69 Bravo at the helipad. And uh, if you haven't had a chance to see that area, it is pretty spectacular what they've been able to do. Um, a private citizen um, donated the land, is that correct? Oh, or no. Sold oh, we sold it for a dollar uh, to make this area um, to allow both the fire department and the sheriffs to have a helipad at the top and have a basic uh, command center. Uh, so and the view from up there, you can see for miles in every direction through the valley, downtown L.A. Um, it was a bit it was a foggy day. So there was uh, the bay was all filled with fog, but you could see the tops of Catalina and Palos Verdes and such. Um, so just the help that that's going to provide to our fire safety and um, public safety in general is just going to be amazing. So uh, thank you to that fine citizen for doing that and for the hard work by the fire department and sheriff's department um, to provide that for us. Um, I also attended the uh, Lindsay Hor uh, Supervisor Horvath had a county community resilience meeting in Agura Hills. Uh, where she brought together a number of uh, public safety agencies from our general area, so Westlake, Agura Hills, Malibu, um, just to get together, let them know what the county's done over the last uh, several years uh, to have a more cohesive plan uh, when the next event happens. Um, so it's uh, ready.la count. Look on the website for the address for that one. I'm sorry. Maybe Keegan knows? No, you don't know either? Okay. Um, but look into that because there's a lot of great information about getting prepared in advance, uh, what everybody needs to do, things you need to do around your house, uh, the home hardening. Uh, make sure you reach out to the city of Malibu. Our public safety department has a lot of great information. So make sure that you're touching base with them. They'll come out to your house. They'll look at your home. They'll look at um, the vegetation that you've got, the other things that you can do to improve your home so that if for some reason um, you don't have a safe place and your home is it, uh, that you know hopefully you can survive the fire if it gets there. But um, And then I would say the best thing that I did. Oh, I did attend the Clean Power Alliance board meeting. That's a fantastic program. Um, that's We are all uh, getting some form of clean power for our power here in Malibu. Uh, we did the program, the community um, alliance was uh, created six or seven years ago in order to get clean power to be delivered to our homes. And um, most homes in Malibu are at 100%. The city's at 
And one of the things recently they did was signed a contract with a new wind farm that's coming on in the next couple years in New Mexico. And it's gonna deliver more power than the Hoover Dam. So that's really exciting, the amount of clean power we're gonna get from that. And that community alliance has um, been remarkable. They're one of the largest in the country to come together to deliver clean power for our area. And we should be really proud that we're a part of that. Um, and then the final thing was the Optimist Club of Malibu. They did their youth appreciation program and they honored students from our five local schools, Malibu Elementary School, Webster Elementary School, Our Lady of Malibu, Malibu Middle School and Malibu High School. And it's just a fabulous program because it um, honors the students on their community spirit and their outreach. Um, and I just wanna read there, if you guys will all indulge me, their creed for the Optimist Club. To be so strong that nothing can disturb your peace of mind. To take health, happiness and prosperity to every person you meet to make all your friends feel that there is something in them, to look at the sunny side of everything and make your optimism come true, to think only of the best, to work only for the best, and to expect only the best, to be just as enthusiastic about the success of others as you are about your own, to forget the mistakes of the past and to press on to greater achievements of the future, to wear a cheerful countenance at all times and give every living creature you meet a smile. To give so much time to the improvement of yourself that you have no time to criticize others. To be too large for worry, too noble for anger, too strong for fear, and too happy to permit the presence of trouble. And I think that's something that our entire community can live by and I'm so proud of the youth in our community that exemplify that. And that's all I've got. Oh, I, I'm sorry, one more thing. I did want to say in response to um, Sergeant Sutherland, with everybody doing anything, just do one thing at a time. We don't need to be multitasking, especially when we're driving. When you're driving, it's a big deal. And just do that one thing while you're doing that. Okay? Thank you. Hey, Marianne, thank you very much. Paul, you want to jump on it? Sure. I, I really like going after Mary Ann because I was at a lot of those same <laughs> events. So she's already done a good job of describing what went on. So I just have to say I was there. Uh, we were all at the groundbreaking for the high school and that was a very wonderful event. And I'm so grateful that it's there and that we got it started before the rains came so that they can continue the grading and hopefully get the kids in a little sooner than we could have if we tried to start a week later. And uh, so that was great. I had the pleasure of attending the business round table. Uh, I also went to the half marathon and I am part of CERT team and I and one other guy worked the CERT team and worked the half marathon. And, and my post was on Pacific Coast Highway yelling across PCH to tell people who'd gotten out of the bus and were ready to jaywalk across PCH right after that, that, that chicane we have. And so I'm very good now at yelling crosswalk. Just yell that word at people and they go, oh, and they walk down to the crosswalk. So I've, I've developed a new skill. So if I yell crosswalk at you, I want you to go to the crosswalk. Uh, the other thing is uh, these, Marianne and I were both at the school separation meetings and it really seems like we're making some progress and I, I hope that soon there will be something significant to report. Uh, the, uh, and I was also at the community safety meeting in uh, Gura. Was it Gura? Yeah, it was Gura. And uh, in the next few days, I'll be going to a state of the cities for Calabasas and Agoura Hills. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Bruce? Okay, thank you. So, um, unlike other members of council, I don't, I don't attend a lot of events. I, I feel that um, my help for the council is better spent um, doing research on issues that can help the city, and I also field a lot of um, 
questions and comments from residents, which I've been, so I've been doing both of those things for the past couple of weeks. And we'll be talking about some of that when we get to the um, emergency declaration issue. Um, I did attend an ANF committee meeting with Doug. Um, other than that, that's, that, those are the kinds of things I've been doing. Um, I'm hopeful that this PCH task force meeting is going to be substantive and not a dog and pony show. I mean, we, we need action. We don't need just words. And a lot of times when politicians all speak, including us, we just get a lot of words and not action. So I'm hopeful that um, there will be actions proposed and follow up on those actions. And if you don't hear actions being proposed, press for action, because that's the only way anything's going to happen. Talking is not going to get us anywhere. Um, and as far, and, and one other thing I've been looking into, and I'd like to see if we can get a consensus to bring back an item actually is, you know, the PSPS, whatever that stands for, the, um, the, safety, the, the safety power shutoffs, um, they, first of all, they um, affect inordinately a certain segment of the population, even though they benefit the entire population. So if you take the, the Cuthbert circuit, for example, which is shut off all the time, so Point Doom, um, up and down PCH in different directions from there, um, they all lose their power, and the point is supposedly that that saves Malibu and also saves Valley, it saves, it saves other areas. And this happens not just in Malibu, obviously. Um, I think, one, the city should be exploring ways to help the residents who are losing power repeatedly for the benefit of all residents. At a bare minimum, things like providing dry ice so food doesn't spoil, um, helping with um, getting generators. Maybe even maybe there can be even community generation um, generators that work part time and are good enough to um, provide minimum power. I don't know, but I think we need to explore that. And I, in my view, that would be an appropriate use of city funding, even though it doesn't um, directly go to the benefit of all city residents. It's to offset a detriment that is benefiting all city residents. In that same light, I would like, this is the thing I'd like to get consensus for. I'd like to see us um, lobby the state to adopt legislation that creates a fine or, or a penalty or just a price for SCE, or, or all the power companies for that matter, which is based on per hour per customer of downed, of purposefully downed power. And it could go into a fund, which could then be used as it accumulates to harden the energy grid, to either, one, provide alternative routes for the energy to reach the areas. And it's, again, the Cuthbert circuit by way of example. The reason it shut off is not because there's a danger in Malibu. The reason it shut off is because there's a danger up in the mountains. And they, but it's all part of one circuit. The same thing with the Sarah circuit. It goes all the way to Mulholland. So Malibu residents lose power so that the dangerous power lines in the hills can be protected or, or so that they don't cause a problem. Um, it seems to me just like railroads can route, can route trains to different routes, the elect power companies ought to be able to, and I think they can, route power differently. So there's no reason why the power for the city of Malibu can't come down PCH when it's being shut down in the hills. And it costs money to create those, um, those new routes. Again, this, this, this legislation could provide a source of um, funding to do that. The other thing, of course, which we hear about all the time is undergrounding. It's very expensive. I understand why SC doesn't want to do it. But they, need, they need to feel a cost for turning off the power so that they are incentivized to do things that don't require them to shut off the power. So um, those are my things for today. And I want to thank the public speakers. And let me see if I've missed anything. That's it. Thank you. Oh, any any chance we could, we could get an, a letter or something to the state proposing that they take a look at this? Because it's 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 something that seriously affects us repeatedly. Uh, let, let me say I I think it needs more study. I I heard uh, council member here, and I think there needs to be a better briefing about how the SCE operates. Uh, not that I'm uh, back in SCE in this, but if you look at the Cutbird circuit this time as opposed to five years ago, they used to shut the whole thing off. Now they've got it in little pocket zones. And it's a lot different than when they used to cut it off in mass. And I think there's uh, uh, probably worthwhile to have a set of briefings outside the council to make sure we understand the problem.
before we send the letter in. So if we could uh, maybe have a private briefing, maybe with SCE, maybe for uh, the council member, maybe anybody else that can attend, Brown Act considerations, obviously. But I think we need to be brief before we go any further on it. You know, I, and, and I'd like to get SEC in front of us. I don't think I need to do it in, in private. Uh, but, I, you know, I, I mean, they, they were doing some work on the street where I live, and I, there was a SEC manager there. Uh, so I say, you know, look, I, I got a question. You know, Santa Ana winds been blowing for a very, very long time. This is not a new phenomenon. What the heck were you guys doing all these years, and why is your infrastructure hardened enough to deal with it? And his answer was, he said, look, the state never made us do that. The state said, whatever you're doing now is fine. Don't worry about it. So they didn't. Right? Even though they knew there was a problem, they just decided not to fix it. Uh, so I'd like to get them here and get some answers in terms of what they're doing, what they're not doing. I mean, I've had a bunch of people call up and say we should, you know, we should really push to get undergrounding on the circuits that they're cutting off. All right. I mean, th there may be some things we can get them to do uh, that they're not doing now. But I, as opposed to, I tend to agree. I'd like to get more information, get them in front of us before we do something. Yeah, and I, and I fully agree about um, more information. They are, they've made changes, but we need to hear what their changes are and what we possibly can do. Um, and I think that's an excellent idea. Yeah, I want to know when the infrastructure is going to be, when they're going to have an infrastructure in place that they don't have to shut off the power. That's their job. I mean, what, you know, they're paying their shareholders money, and you know, there's a whole bunch of money floating around out there. It's not, none of it's helping us, so I'm sorry. I, I just want to point out that under the uh, their license to operate in the state of California, they're guaranteed a profit. And when they lose litigation, they get permission to pass it on to the people who they screwed in the first place. So we get to pay ourselves. It's it's really a very circular kind of a thing. And it's we, we need a different system. Welcome to California. All right. Doug, you, Bruce? Well, it sounds like we're not going to get that for now, but it's just, just the last point on that is, you know, SCE is a for-profit corporation, and the only way they are going to spend money to harden our infrastructure, as well as other areas like us, is if they're legislatively required to do so or if there is a cost of them not doing so that is greater than the cost of them doing so. Otherwise, they have no incentive to do anything other than continue to send us bills and not supply us power when they feel like they can't because it's safer and less expensive for them to turn the power off. Okay. Uh, I don't disagree with anything that's been said about SCE, but let's get them in here to talk to us. And if we're going to go make a statement to the state legislature, make sure we're informed and we're uh, logical in our presentation as opposed to maybe shooting from the hip. Um, Paul and Mary Ann, it's easy to follow behind them because I didn't quite go to all the places they did, but I did 69 Bravo. I did Lindsay Horvath's presentation. I was at the uh, half marathon. Oh, I didn't run. And uh, I was at the business round table. So I get part of the credit for that. And one of these days, Mary Ann's going to tell us what her time was. Um, I'd like to start off with uh, uh, a proposal I'd like to make to the council and see if we get some support to bring this back in a more formal uh, setting. Uh, I think the recent um, planning item for the home on Zoomeres, where we had a 2-2 tie uh, from the Planning Commission, as well as other situations where recusal, or recusals have taken place, have highlighted the need to have a full complement of commissioners in the Planning Commission present and able to vote on matters uh, when they come before them. I'd like to propose and request council approval to bring back uh, at a future meeting a proposal for, and I'm going to read this back, the option, but not the requirement, for each council member to be able to appoint an alternate planning commissioner. The alternate would be available upon notice by the primary commission member that a recusal was needed, there was a medical reason the primary could not attend, or there was a reason the primary could not attend due to travel or business re reasons. I'd like to request that this, if the, we approve this, that the city attorney prepare a memo as to what would need to be accomplished so that this may be uh, done but I want to warn everybody, I am talking to the city attorney in private, as well as some other uh, planning commission, uh, planning department people. This is new ground. Apparently, it's never been done in California before. And uh, we'd be uh, setting a, a new standard for this. And um, I think with the memo from the city attorney and understand what we'd have to do and maybe discuss the benefits of this, 
we would be able to uh, have this meeting and discuss uh, this adjunct uh, item for the Planning Commission. Do I have any support for that, please? I would be in support of uh, the city attorney producing whatever information we would need to make an informed decision. I would also. I've been in mail for I don't know how many years. Spent four years on the Planning Commission. And I think once we, we had a problem where we had a tie vote because somebody had to recuse themselves. I mean, I think you're taking shotgun out to kill mice. I mean, uh, it seems like. And the other thing, and, and to go back to when you appointed your, your Planning Commission, you said the key was that Planning Commissioners really have to get, understand what the rules are and how to apply them. I mean, if I've got this person that doesn't do anything for three years, and then one day I call on him and say, go in and be a planning commissioner, what do you think he's going to be able to do? I mean, how, how good do you think he's going to be in terms of understanding what's been going on and what the rules are? I, so I hear you. I just don't think, I don't, I don't see this as a problem that has caused us enormous amount of concern over time. Bruce? Well, I'll, I'll support bringing it back because I actually support bringing back anything that anyone on this council feels is important to talk about. So I will, I'll support that. I am inclined to be opposed to the uh, proposal itself when it comes back for discussion, although I'll, I'll wait to hear more information. But, you know, a, a 2 2 tie is a rejection. It's the same thing as a 3 1 decision or a 3 2 decision or a 4 1 decision. It's just a rejection. 2 1 decision is a rejection also. So I don't think there's a problem when there might be occasionally be a 2-2 two -two tie. It's just, a, it's just another way to get to know. Um, and I actually like ways to get to know. And I'm, I know some people disagree with that. But um, projects that are not objectionable don't end up with no. Projects that are objectionable often end up with that, yes. So I have no problem with more ways to get to know. Uh, I would like to make a clarifying comment. One of the things, this isn't about breaking the 2-2 two -two tie as much as it is to make sure that, A, everyone on the council has a representative at the Planning Commission meetings. And secondly, I found when I was doing my uh, inquiries about who might be able to be on the Planning Commission, one of the first things that came back with is, I can't commit to all, 20, to all 12, meeting, 12 months, two meetings a month or 22 meetings a year or whatever it comes out to, plus any special meetings. So this is as much trying to uh, take this job. It has a lot of time commitment and maybe split it up among more than one person. That would be the, be the potential. But I think if we could just bring it back and have a hearing on it and see what the merits are or demerits, it would give us a chance to see what was worthwhile. And just one, one last comment, which is, you know, I, Trevor, will, um, I suspect will tell you this if you ask him directly. Um, as far as what needs to be done to get it done or can it be done, we can do pretty much, and I mean, it, I'm, I'm going to say anything, but there are lots of things we can do by adopting ordinances, and that's one of them. Whether it makes sense to do it or not is another question, but we don't really need our lawyer to tell us whether we can or can't do it, because we clearly can. Well, it just depends on whether it conflicts with state law. We have the uh, police power, anything that's not controlled by the state or the county, then we have those abilities to regulate. I do know that Avalon has an alternate planning commissioner. It's one planning commissioner that, that serves as an alternate for the rest of the, uh, the planning commission body. Um, I haven't seen this where it be a um, one for one type of replacement, but I'm happy to look into it. Looks like we have a consensus to do that. I'll, I'll bring it back. I'm going to, again, you've heard yes. where I think I'm coming from in this thing. But if we want to bring it back and talk about it, I don't have a problem with that. All right. So it sounds like I got three and a half votes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, I mean, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fully in favor of bringing it back. I got four. I got four. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Other comments I'd like to make. Uh, first off, I want to highlight the performance of the city staff uh, on Thursday the 9th when a fire broke out uh, in Topanga just after 1 a.m. Uh, ironically, on this, this was on the fifth anniversary of the Woolsey fire, and our public safety staff had two liaisons quickly at the command center at Fire uh, Department Camp 8. Now, you gotta, if anybody's been up there, that's not easy to get to. And we had two people up there almost immediately. Uh, and the city was putting out regular updates shortly after the fire broke out. This was a far cry from what we had five years ago when it was basically a city manager and a public safety director scrambling, and there was no one to talk for our case, with the command post, the uh, EOCs, and elsewhere, so quite a change. We were ready for we were ready for it, and thank you all very much. 
by the way, they had the uh, open house for public safety the same day. They looked a little tired when I went by, but they did a great job. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I attended the Veterans Day ceremony that was held last Saturday here in the council chambers. This is the 24th time we've had a ceremony uh, like this here in Malibu. And I gotta tell you, it was, pre it was truly an honor to be in the presence of these heroes and remember the people that cannot be with us anymore and have served our country well. It was uh, very emotional for me and I think many of the people that were here. And, and uh, I encourage you next year to go. It's, it's, a, it's a reminder of what we have and what we have to, have to be careful to protect. Uh, PCH Task Force meets tomorrow at 10 a.m. We've already talked about that. Uh, this is a very important meeting, and I think the concerned citizens need to be there to see it. Uh, I will give you a little bit of a, a peek in, behind the curtain. I think the city is going to make a strong case for uh, what we think we need and what we expect to, to see and talk about the city's performance, as well as what the other people are going to talk about, what they're going to do. So please stay tuned. See you in the morning. Um, let's see. Last Monday, I attended my... Uh, Planning Commission uh, members uh, new swearing in. I believe I got a very good candidate to fill that Planning Commission position and uh, very glad that uh, he accepted the post. But I want you to know that during the last eight months, I've interviewed seven possible Planning Commission candidates, four of which I brought in, actually I brought in uh, uh, more than four to talk to me about this. Three of these seven were women. I just want people to know that I was actually outreaching very, very diligently for that. And all but one of the seven expressed uh, concerns about the unwarranted comments that would be on social media and elsewhere and that would affect their professional careers and their reputation here in Malibu. And the reason why I bring that up is this was a major reason they didn't want to take the post. It's because of the social grief that they were going to catch if they took the job. Very qualified people, very qualified. And they said, you know, time commitment's in there too, but they're going, it isn't worth it for my professional career to be involved in this. So I want the social media posters and the others that make these unwarranted comments, when they make the complaints about the quality of appointees, they should only look at their own posts and comments to see what damage their uh, accusations are really making to dissuade quality people from wanting to volunteer to serve in our city. It's not easy to get good people to come to the forefront. So please keep that in mind. You're making it hard for us to get these quality people up here. Thank you. Oh, and last comment. Set the pace on PCH. I've said this before. Every one of us has a control. When, they, when you say, what could I do to help make PCH safer? Look down at your speedometer. If it says 45 on the speed limit sign, do 45. If we can't set the pace, how can we expect others to do it? Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Okay, I'm not going to repeat everything everybody else has said. Uh, I did do a tour with Yolanda Bundy and some of the other uh, consultants we have working on Dark Skies. We did it um, with uh, Mary Ann. Uh, we did a tour of some of the commercial properties here in Malibu and took a look at what we've accomplished so far and what we have to, to do to improve that. So there's a meeting this Wednesday, I think at 1 o'clock, uh, to talk about any potential changes to our Dark Sky ordinance to allow us to, to get this thing implemented a little bit quicker. I was also at the Veterans Day event uh, on Saturday, and it was it was an extremely well done event. Uh, I think the speakers were there, the, the veterans who were, were there uh, did a heck of a job talking about what their experiences were. So it was a very very well done event. Uh, PCH Task Force, we've done that, so I'm not going to go through that again. Uh, and I've talked about SEC. I just think I'm like living in a third world country. This is nuts. Uh, so I'd like to see that. I'd like to have them come back and let's talk about that. So with that, uh, any other questions from anybody, Paul? You have reminded me that I was at the Veterans Day event, and you did a great job of introducing and representing the city. Thank you well, very much, well, Steve. Thank you very much. Some days rather be lucky than good. Okay. Uh, let's go back. Consent calendar. Anybody pull anything from the consent calendar? Steve, I'm sorry. You were... That's all right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to make sure that we have consensus from the council to, to invite a representative from Southern California, Edison, to come and answer some oh, questions on, I, on I, I public safety power shutoffs. Yes. You bet your life. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, consent calendar. Anybody pull anything? 
We don't have any speaker slips, and I don't see any raised hands in Zoom. Bruce? Um, I'm going to vote against 3B4. I don't know if that requires that it be pulled or if it could just note my dissent. And I'd like to yep. pull 3B8, please. Okay. Well, let's pull 3B4 and 3B8 then. Uh, can I, you get a I motion to I, approve the calendar, everything else? On the if he just wants to note his, his uh, dissent, he can do so. He doesn't need to pull the item. Yeah, I mean, you want to tell us why? Or? I, I, it was the same item that I dissented from two weeks ago, so it's the same reason. Okay. Then we don't have to do 3B4, we just do 3B8? Yeah. What do you, we do you, with 3B4 you, then? Just you can do a motion for pull 3B8, but the motion to approve the balance noting um, the, the no vote for okay. 3B4. What he just said. We want to... Uh, Get that? Okay. I'll second that. Roll call, Kelsey. I'm sorry, I did actually miss who made the motion. The mayor. Mayor Uring? Yes. Councilman Berger Santi? Yes. Councilman Ber Riggins? Yes. Councilman Ber Silverstein? Yes, with the no mayor. <laughs> mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Mary Ann, 3B8. I, I just. just wanted to get a little bit more background. I, I see that we're. Re Recommended to reject the bid, um, and I'm sorry I did not get a chance to discuss this with staff in advance, so they don't have a heads up. But what latitude do we have? I see that the bids came in for more money than what was budgeted. Is it just a budgetary item that could be rectified by increasing the budget, or are we rejecting the bids because we just feel we could do better um, and get closer to the budgeted item? We're just increasing costs and everything. I'm not surprised there are more. Right. Uh, um, so good evening, Council, and I'll be happy to answer this question. Yeah, we, uh, the bids came in higher than what our budget is, and so our recommendation is to reject the bids. There's two sections of the project. There's the refurbishment of the Legacy Park benches. There are the wood benches that need to be uh, refinished, sanded, and the second part of it is the painting of the metal arbors. and. Um, looking at the bids and looking at the work that needs to be done, um, we felt that it was it, it was more prudent to start the work on the benches and hold off on the the arbors, painting the arbors. We can hold it off doing that work for probably another year, um, painting the arbors. But what we're planning on doing is potentially coming back to mid-year budget, asking for additional funds for the arbors rebid that section out specifically for that work. Um, this work potentially could be two separate kind of contractors doing the work. One of them is doing woodwork and, and finishing that. The other one is steel um, painting construction. Um, so they're two kind of distinct projects. Um, we felt that separate them out, bid them this way, we're gonna get better bids and better results. Has the arbor had any attention or maintenance done to it since it was erected? I believe our community services department has done um, slight maintenance on it, but it needs there. There is um, areas where it's rusty, and it, it could take a um, some work to actually remove that rust. And it's not normal maintenance activities. Okay, Bruce. Oh, Bruce, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I'd just like to make a suggestion when the um, benches are addressed, um, if, if it's appropriate. Uh, I find that a lot of the time the benches are being used as beds for unhoused um, people, at least camping out during the day, if not in the evening as well so from time to time. I wonder if you couldn't put, if it's appropriate to think about rails, um, arms, rails, whatever, every so many feet on the benches. It won't stop two people from sitting next to each other if they want to, to enjoy the outdoors, um, but it will stop people from laying on them and sleeping on them, which is not what they're designed for. Yeah, and, and we could look at that during construction. Doug? Yeah, um, I hadn't thought about bringing this up, but since it's out, I, I'll make the comment. As a boater, wooden bright work is one of the last things you want on your boat. It looks great when you paint it and you, you Varnish it and everything else, and everybody goes, ooh and ah. And then you realize after about six weeks, you got to come back and do it again. Isn't that what we're doing with this wood? I, I wonder why we've got wood benches in there. 13 years. Yeah. No, this isn't the first time it's been done. Yeah, this isn't the first time. Yeah, this will be the second time we did it. Right. Um, probably about 
two, three years ago. I think, we're, I think it was longer than that. The last time we did it, it's been a while. But it's cost how much? Uh, $100,000? I mean, how much do the benches cost? I, I um, right. don't have the numbers of what the benches would be, but I, I think just the refurbishment of the benches part of it was, I am thinking it would be under $50,000 Okay, to do I'll, 34. I'll be quiet then. But, okay. Uh, I can tell you, the first thing everybody says when they walk by their second boat is, I don't want to have any wood on it, so I'll leave it up to you. Well, do we want to be a city that has recycled materials in their nice park, or do we want to have natural materials and have to? I I'm just putting it out there. I'm not asking for, it's a rhetorical question, so. <laughs> when they fix the benches, they do look nice. I mean, they do a good, whoever did it last time did an excellent job, so for whatever that's worth. Okay. Uh, I'd like to make a motion that we accept the recommendation to reject the bids. I'll second that. Kelsey, roll call. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Mayor Uring? Yes. Motion carries. Very good. All right, we're on to item 5A, uh, the Woolsey Fire Fee Waiver Program. Can we get a staff report, please? And do we have any speaker slips, Kelsey? Yes, we do. They're coming right now. Okay, cool. Good evening, Mayor and members of the Council. The item before you this evening stems from about two meetings ago, I want to say, where there was a question when we brought forward the resolution about the eligibility of uh, you know, who qualifies for a Woolsey fee waiver since we extended the program. And the question that came up had to do with inheritance and change of ownership because of uh, just changes in the family, but yet they are the still the same family that was occupying the property at the time of the fire. And what we've got this evening for you is a modified resolution as well as an option uh, to clarify the, who is a heir, a heir of a property. The option you see before you, it's option one in your staff report, is the uh, current language that is in the resolution that's attached to tonight's council packet agenda, uh, council agenda. And essentially, this is uh, the, the way that staff has been applying the program, where if somebody is a qualified property owner, and the, they pass, the, we look to see if the folks who now own the property, if they are an heir of that family, um, you know, son, daughter, or in some cases, uh, the property just transfers ownership from husband to wife. Uh, we've had properties that are under the husband's name, the husband passes, now it's the wife who owns the property. So this is more general. The, the text you have that is in underline there is what we're proposing to add to the resolution. That would be the, the difference. The second option would be to make it a bit more specific and use the language and uh, that is in the California State Revenue and Taxation Code section 62 and 63. And we've included that as an attachment for you in the agenda report. And this is a bit more narrow, uh, and this essentially uh, identifies the transfer type situations, and it's not as broad as what you see in option one. And so if it's the council's wish, we can modify the resolution to option two, or we could just continue with option one, which essentially memorializes what we've been doing. And just to kind of go over this at a, a high level, you've got the specifics here in front of you, but these, you know, sometimes some of the transfers we see, like I was mentioning between husband and wife, the change of ownership from say, uh, owning it in a, a name to owning it in a trust. Uh, but these are all the various situations that would qualify as essentially the, the same family at the time of the fire. 
I'm available for any questions. And of course, the last option, should the council want it, is just to strike any reference to being able to transfer the ability of the fee waiver to uh, somebody other than the, the person listed on title at the time of the fire. Thank you. All right, any questions for Richard? Paul? Uh, Richard, uh, I, personally, I'm in favor of option one, I think, uh, but my, my question is, what happened to the moratorium on new view protection in the fire area? I'm hearing that when it expired, we started doing view protection uh, uh, new ones, and it's already caused a problem on on a case where somebody, there was a two story before, and now they're being told they can only have a one story because the people have now filed a new view protection. Are we recording new view protections or was that person mistaken when they called me? I, I wanna say that might've been uh, ordinance 456, 495. I'd have to get the exact number. But the way that ordinance was written, was that there was a moratorium for four years after the fire and on structures. So claiming a view over a structure. So the idea was within four years, folks would have an opportunity to rebuild their structures. And then it provided for, I want to say, somewhere in the back of my head, I'm hearing nine, but I want to say 10, 10 year moratorium on claiming a view over uh, landscaping in the fire areas. So the person who claimed a view did it one month after the moratorium ended per the code. Okay. Uh, was it other, were other people aware that that portion was not being extended? That was, that was a separate ordinance beyond the fee waivers. So we would need to bring that one back if we wanted to extend that one also? Correct, so in front of, uh, what, what, what we're bringing in front of the council at this time, uh, at the council's request, is the fee waiver program, which is by resolution, and then also revisiting the ordinance that provided for the planning verifications for the non-conforming fire rebuilds uh, under our non-conforming section of the code. So yes, that is correct. That is a different section of the code. Uh, of course, if it's the council's wish, we could uh, bring an item on that section, but that was not one of the sections listed. Bruce? Yes, uh, yeah, that's what I, I appreciate that these were questions, but we're, we're starting to go into okay. discussion, so I'd like to hear public comment before we discuss that issue further. All right, I've got one public speaker, Norm. And I think Snorth is going to bring us back to this exact topic, right? So, thank you very much, honorable uh, council members and chair Earing. Um, I'm afraid I'm the guy that brought up the, this one issue with regard. Uh, let me state that I'm in favor of the motion that's in front of you tonight with regard to the fee waiver. Uh, program for people that uh, either own the property or transferred the property uh, to someone that's a family member. I'm 100% in support of that. <clears throat> the protections that were supposed to be provided to the fire rebuilds lasted for four years. And what it said was, for, for four years, you cannot file a primary view determination, a new one, or one that is modified over a person's property that lost his home. And that ended approximately a year ago. I have a client who filed an application to build a home on one of the fire rebuild properties. There were three properties that all burned down all the vegetation burned down, and all of a sudden, someone 750 feet away had an ocean view. So they ran down 34 days after the moratorium was lifted and filed a primary view determination. 
Uh, that doesn't seem fair to me because of the delays that were caused by lawsuits, try, people trying to get their, their uh, uh, Woolsey Fire insurance paid off. Took a long time. I think uh, uh, Council Member Silverstein uh, was involved in some of those and knows how difficult, no. But it was very difficult. There are some people that have just gotten their Woolsey Fire money uh, and now they're hiring architects and trying to go through the process and it takes time, uh, of which I'm running out of. Um, the bottom line is the person filed it the day that the hearing was supposed to take place on a clean sheet project, no variances, no minor modifications, comes up and says, I filed a primary view ordinance, a new one, over my client's property. And all of a sudden, they ran out there that afternoon. This is one week ago, just before the Planning Commission met. Sure enough, you can see a small portion of the water. I don't think that's correct. I think the protection should be extended. Thank you very much Thanks, for your Norman. time. Yeah, uh, let me see if there's any other speakers. Any hands? There's no raised hands. All right, uh, Bruce, back to you. I'll bring it back to the council table. Public comments closed. Tried to get a settlement, took a long time. He finally decided to settle. Okay. Second question for you is, is, is the home that they're seeking to build that will block the newly de determined view protection higher than the house that was there before? My understanding is that, no, that that's not the case. The original house was two stories high, and uh, although it's difficult to determine the exact height because the county lost the plans, we do have a very accurate aerial topography, and it was determined to be uh, a two-story house by the tax assessor. They, they stated it was two stories. Uh, council, council members, this is actually a pending item before the Planning Commission, and it was continued to a December date, is my understanding. And so I'd suggest that we don't take testimony about that particular project. If there are questions in general about view determinations or that issue you want to put on a future agenda, that's not on the agenda item right here. But I just don't want to, uh, us to take testimony from one party here talking about an item that could come before the City Council itself at a future date. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you, Norm. Any other questions, comments? Uh, yeah, on this uh, issue about view ordinances, I think uh, I believe Richard, the planning director, made the comment it was two different ordinances. And I, th I think the city attorney, I'm looking over at him, is going to tell me that we need to bring this back as a separate item. Is that correct? If you want to consider um, the city's uh, view preservation, an extension of the view city's view preservation ordinance, um, uh, sorry, on the, the, the uh, moratorium on the view preservation ordinance that was put in place during Woolsey, you would need to put that as a future agenda item. It's not on the agenda tonight. Okay. Uh, the reason why I also bring that up, there was a, a comment made at uh, one of the other appeals we had a few months ago that I thought one of the architects had a good comment about it. He said that uh, when we send out the postcards announcing that there's going to be a review or projects coming up for consideration, that there ought to be a time limit to put the uh, view ordinance uh, request in. Can't be up to the last minute before the filing was, and that was the basis of this appeal we were seeing. So I do think we need to bring this back for perhaps a better look at the view ordinance in total. However, I'll make the comment, by the time we tell everybody what we're about to do, anybody that doesn't have a view ordinance uh, in place is already gonna do it. So uh, this may be moot by the time we see it. Bruce? Okay, so um, on the item that is before us, um, I support extending this. I don't support adding the except for heirs of previously qualified property owners. The reason I don't support that is not because I don't think it's a good idea. I think it is a good idea that should have been in place five years ago. But it seems to me that what we're doing here is we're extending the exact same benefit that we've had in place for five years for an additional period of time for people that didn't have an opportunity to take advantage of it. If we were to add that language now, we're actually not only extending it, we're actually granting them an additional benefit that people for the past five years did not have. I suspect there are people that lost the benefit by virtue of transfers 
and it, it just doesn't sit right with me when you're extending something that there's there's disputes. Some residents don't think we should be ex extending it. I do, but we shouldn't be adding an additional benefit to the extension. On the other issue, I'll say also, I, I think the view protection moratorium was a half-baked idea in the first place because it didn't, as I understand it, protect whatever view was already in place with the house that used to be there. So it gave an opportunity for somebody to build an even larger, higher house that would block a view that did exist. And it, it, to me, it wasn't thought out well. So if it were to come back, I'd want to actually think it out properly as opposed to simply having a moratorium. Yep. Bruce, I'm a little uncertain. Do you, do you think option one is better than option two? Or do you think neither of them sh is needed? If, if I might add that question. Option one is, the, is, is what we've been working with so far, right, Richard? Yeah, but Richard changed the, yeah. That is correct, Mayor. If essentially, that's what we've been doing. We're just putting it in writing. So if I can give a little background, because um, there were a few people who passed away shortly after the fire that were the original homeowners of the properties. And the um, children of those people had elected, and some of them have completed the home and have moved into those homes. So my intention of making sure that this stayed in there was that that didn't go away when we were doing the extension of the fee waivers. Um, I, I just want to make sure that they're protected and they don't lose that right um, that they have had all the last five years um, since it was originally passed by previous councils. So that was my intention. I think section two reads a little too broad. Um, and, you know, my thoughts on it were, and I believe the way it has been implemented, it was just the children of the parents that were eligible. Even though it says heirs, it, it or are we, have we been? We've done children, then the other item that's come up has been, as I mentioned, the transfer of the property from a person's name to a trust. Uh, so that it continues on to their kids. I've seen that one as well. Okay. I'm going to make a motion that we uh, approve the staff recommendation using option one, and we bring back for further discussion the view ordinance items so we know what the heck we're doing. I'll second. Roll call, Kelsey. Mayor Yuri. Yes. Councilmember Riggins. Yes. Councilmember Grisanti. Yes. Councilmember Silverstein. No. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart. Yes. Motion carries. All right, let's move to item 5B. Initiate code amendments to address home sharing. Richard, you're on again. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. The item before you this evening is direction to staff for us to initiate a, uh, a local coastal program amendment to address home sharing within the city of Malibu. This item was first brought to the council in the uh, April timeframe. And now we are back uh, with a couple examples that we received from the California Coastal Commission of uh, local coastal program amendments that address this issue. And we put those uh, as attachments to your report uh, to provide guidance uh, to be some of the guidance we use as we move forward and work with the California Coastal Commission, if the council directs us to, to work on a local coastal program amendment to address these uh, home sharing type uses that are similar uh, to a timeshare. If there are any questions, I'd be glad to answer those. And the procedure for this, just to refresh the council, would be that uh, once initiated tonight, we would put together a draft ordinance. We could present that to the city's Zo Races subcommittee, unless directed by the council, but that's a typical practice. And then to uh, the planning commission for a recommendation and then back to this council for adoption. And then we would send it to the coastal commission for certification. Thank you, Richard. Any questions for Richard? Doug, you first, go ahead. Uh, 
I want to confirm that we have sent a letter to Picasso and any other uh, similar companies about this, or where we have notified them. We have sent a notice to Picasso, informed them that their practices in the city are um, not allowed under our current regulations, and the proposed amendment here would confirm that, remove any um, any question. Um, this, uh, I think, as Richard mentioned, the. The Coastal Commission recently approved two cities um, that prohibited this practice throughout their cities because it does have a negative impact on housing within their cities. It does not, um, at that been turned to be a visitor server or provide any um, positive benefits that would um, pose any kind of uh, obstacle to uh, approval by the Coastal Commission. So this is just a, this is just an approval to bring it back for final consideration. Correct? No, this is the initiation, initiation of the local coastal amendment and the paired municipal code amendment. So that will go forward. The process will start. Um, that will go to Zeraces, unless you want to send it directly to the Planning Commission, and then it'll come back to the City Council for approval and then submission to the Coastal Commission. Right. Okay. Bruce. Bruce. Yeah. Doug, you get an answer? I got it. Okay. I have an answer. Thank you. Bruce? Could you give us a timeline of how this will spin out? For, I mean, to get, not to get approval from Coastal, but to go through Zeraces, to go through Planning Commission, to get back to us before it can be submitted to the Coastal Commission? Certainly. Uh, what we would end up doing the first I uh, one of the first items to address is, is on your uh, first page there of the agenda packet we've got the strategic priority uh, right now this is listed as a day-to-day -day operation if it becomes one of the priorities of, of the group the council we would then move we can move it up something like this is usually a if it becomes a priority, a six to eight month process for staff. But uh, the wild card here is that uh, the planning commission could ask for, we could provide us some recommendations, ask us to bring it back. Uh, we have seen situations where we've gone back to the planning commission about three times before coming back to this body. Uh, but typically something like this in the past uh, has been along that timeline. We would definitely work with the California Coastal Commission um, and ideally, the goal would be to follow the examples that you see in your packet, which if you look at those examples, it really stems from what our city attorney mentioned, discussing the, the fact that this is not a visitor serving use. And also, uh, the, the bulk of those, the meat, if you will, while well, Carmel did put in there uh, some penalty procedures, there's a paragraph there about a citation as well as another procedure for a misdemeanor for those all all of those involved meaning the brokers the property owners uh, advertising folks marketing um, but it really stems with basically just definitions uh, definitions of timeshare uh, use if you will uh, timeshare property timeshare rental it, it, it there's a they did a lot of definitions to make it very specific and my recommendation as your planning director would be that we follow that uh, guidance from Coastal so that we can have ideally something that works uh, through the co through the Coastal Commission promptly. So if I understood correctly, you're saying that if we make this a priority, it's six to eight months. Six to eight months for what? For us, ideally, from start to finish to get it to the Coastal Commission. Okay, so that, that and what if we skip Zeraces? What, what amount of time, if any, would that save? It, it probably would cut at least a month out of the process because what we would do if this becomes a priority tonight, I would have one of my consultants that handles long range planning start drafting a, some proposed language for uh, both the zone text amendment and the LCPA so that we could get that scheduled in front of the planning commission uh, for their comment. Well, okay. Richard, we actually have some language that we've drafted that we can accelerate that process. This also doesn't need to be, this is not the type of ordinance that is, um, requires significant changes throughout the code, such as ADUs or other types of ordinances. So this one could move faster than I think your normal um, LCP amendment okay. ordinance. Well, are, we, are we statutorily mandated to put this through the Planning Commission? Yes, it does yeah. have to go to the Planning Commission. We don't have any discretion in that whatsoever? No, it's required by state law in our LCP. I will go where you had. I think we skipped the races. Mayor, Mayor, before the council gets too far with discussion, you do have a speaker slip for this item. Oh, I, it's while you're there. Thank you very much. Yes, Joe Drummond. Thank you, Kelsey. 
Hi, I'm glad this is on the agenda and I applaud you for putting this through. I just had um, one comment which is kind of related, but I wanted to know if the short-term rental ordinance, which is similar to this, will come back to the council to be put through forth to the Coastal Commission with something that they can accept, like a 30 to 90 day for primary residents or um, something like, uh, um, like one bedroom apartments being allowed. But I just, I don't know if this is related or not, but I'm just, that's the thing that popped up when I saw this. So I was glad that it was finally on the agenda and it's gonna hopefully get approved, but this is somehow related and I'm just hoping that it can come back. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. All right, any, any hands? No, there are no raised hands. All right, back to the public comments closed and we'll bring it back to the council table. Paul, go ahead. I'd like to make a motion that we uh, vote yes on resolution number 23.16. It's attachment number one in your package. A resolution of the City Council of the City of Malibu initiating an amendment to the Malibu Municipal Code and enacting an, an amendment to the local coastal program local implementation plan addressing timeshare uses in the city and finding the action exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act. I'll second with a friendly amendment that we send it directly to Planning Commission and bypass the races. Much better. Thank you. Any comments? Bruce? Yes. Um, first of all, I, I think it's important for the residents to know that this is something that's been being worked on for some period of time. It's been silent because there have been closed sessions to talk about what to do, not this statute, but what to do because potential litigation. So um, it, it's good that this can now finally come out to the light of day. Um, I know a lot of people have been clamoring for this, and we have not ignored that. We've been working on this. Um, second, um, the it's not in this res I'm not sure if it's in this resolution or not, but it's in the in the report about talking about what to do, if anything, about existing um, Picasso and other uh, multi-owner properties. So. I, I don't know if when we approve this, if we approve this right now, we'd be putting that to the Planning Commission. I'd like it not to be part of what's going forward because I think it's going to slow things down. And I, also, and I think it's something that we can address after we have something in place that addresses whether this is lawful or not. I mean, our, our view is it's not lawful already. We're, 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 we're kind of belt and suspendering it through this proposal if it's approved with, by the Coastal Commission, but I'd like to see us not say anything at this point in time about the existing homes. They're, they're, they're illegal, um, and we can address what happens about that down the line. Um, and lastly, with respect to Joe's comment, um, you know, that, that's also something, there's an ad hoc committee and it's being worked on. So uh, d Trevor, does what we're being asked to approve include anything about the existing homes because it's in the report but I don't see it in the resolution so you're initiating the the zone text amendment and the and the um, LCP amendment to confirm the prohibition on timeshare use and operations such as Picasso in the city um, that would be broad enough to encompass if the Planning Commission wants to recommend that you make some kind of um, can't, um, treatment for how to deal with people that um, have illegally created these at this point in time. It'd be broad enough to, to do that, but I don't think staff would be intending to propose that at this point in time. Planning Commission could, of course, whatever we put forward, recommend that you add provisions such as that. If you want to be specific about um, exploring that or not exploring that, you're welcome to provide that direction right now. So I, I would like to request a friendly amendment to direct the Planning Commission to do no more than consider the pr appropriate language of a prohibition that can be submitted to the Coastal Commission, not address existing homes. We you accept that, Paul? And Marianne? I think so, yes. Yeah, I'm in. Agreed. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. We got a motion. Kelsey? Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Mayor Uring? Yes. Motion carries. All right. Before we go to the next one, can we get 
um, view of the city attorney, whether Doug and I or whoever it was last time felt they might need to recuse themselves, do yes. need to or don't need to? Yes. Um, for this item, my understanding from the, the, from the um, council members who have donated to KBU in the past, um, if you could all just confirm for me that you did not make any donations specifically for this project. That is correct. 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 I don't think there's such a thing as a donation that's specific for any particular project. You can, you, I mean, that was the issue in the high school lights case that they were donating specifically for the high school lights project. In this case, we have before us not a, a, a entitlement that's, a, that's proposed here before the uh, before the, the city council, but this is an MOU and an agreement um, that's being set up um, for this project. So we're not sitting in a quasi-judicial situation where due process would attach and we would have an issue that we'd need to deal with a common law potential conflict of interest. This does not violate the Political Reform Act. This is a donation. It's not a source of income for any of the council members that um, did make a donation in the past. So I think everyone is okay to participate in this item. Thanks, Trevor. Okay. So, Susan, you're going to give us a staff report, please. Good evening, Mayor and Council. When we have emergencies and power and out, power is out and cell, cell phone service is out, broadcast radio is one of the only remaining means for mass communication. In addition, FM radio in particular is also capable of sending disaster notifications when we have no power and no cell phone. After the Woolsey fire, uh, KBU came to the city council proposing that he be allowed to put a booster station at Bluffs Park. And let me just back up a little bit because I want to make sure people understand that while there are quite a few FM stations that can be received in Malibu, none of them are received in all of Malibu. So they all have the same challenges. And the one advantage of KBU, if we choose to assist uh, KBU in extending his, uh, his, tra his, um, Sorry, brain part. Um, <laughs> Area of being coverage. able to, to reach all of Malibu is that he's the only FM station that is actually created and dedicated to serving Malibu. All the other FM stations, they, they're not motivated to you know cater to about Malibu's needs. So that's why KBU stands out in particular in this case. So back in 2019, the city council did approve uh, the installation of a booster at Bluffs Park, which immediately after that, KBU began applying for FCC license for that. Now, a lot has happened since then. We had a pandemic which stalled things, um, you know, and then in looking at the project, it's gone back and forth a few times. At what time it was, you know, recommended perhaps instead of at the at the maintenance shack that it should be put at the Michael Landon Center because there's access to electrical power and internet. Uh, the one problem with that area is that it doesn't, the signal is not as good. You wanna be as far out as possible. The further out towards the ocean, the better in order to get around the various ge geological features in the city. Um, and the other thing was there was a proposal to do a surface mount on the Michael London Center, but that would have uh, needed some engineering and some other things. Uh, long story short, in the early 19, 2023, it was decided that it would go back to the maintenance shed where it gets a better signal, it will be more effective. At the same time, I, you know, we decided that this is such an important project. It's so critical to the city's public safety communications that we should enter not only uh, the the uh, service agreement to get the equipment on there, but we should also establish an MOU to formalize our partnership with KBUU as our official uh, broadcast radio um, station for emergencies. And so in this partnership, that's why we have an MOU that outlines what that looks like. And essentially what it means is the city will take a, a financial interest in this booster and this capability. So KBU will be responsible for the equipment, the FCC licenses, and making sure it all operates. 
for this city, we will take on the responsibility of um, installing a mast that's sufficient to hold the antenna that's needed and uh, working with him, you know, ongoing to make sure that we're able to effectively communicate to the whole community. Uh, if the council approves uh, this partnership, the next step will be to work all, <laughs> we'll be working with the planning department to get a conditional use permit and a coastal development permit. And then once we have the permits, we will start working with vendors to install the necessary mass for the antennas. And that's my report, if you have any thank, questions. Thank you, Susan. Any questions for Susan, please? Anybody? Any, I don't have any speaker slips, any raised hands? There's one raised hand from Hans Lutz. Hans, you're on. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Honorable Mayor, uh, I'm here for your questions and I thank you for your consideration. Okay, any questions for Hans? Can I get a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. Kelsey, roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Gusanti? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Uring? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Tell you what, guys, we're moving pretty good. I've got my suggestion would be let's do 6B and 6C and then well, 6B and then we can take a break. We only have three left and that'll be uh okay. I'll, let's go to 6B. Alexis, I believe this is yours. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you so much. Before you, for item 6B, you do have staff's recommendation to adopt resolution um, 2351, which would be authorizing the one-time closure of city offices for the designated period of Friday, December 22nd through Monday, January 1st, 2024. Um, a few points that I want to emphasize here is this would be a family-friendly closure, if that makes sense. Um, this does stem back from the Council's adoption of the new strategic work plan back on September 27th. We had that special meeting here. One of the top items identified was to address the Malibu culture. Within that, there were several initiatives that were defined uh, within some of those uh, that we're bringing forward to you now was the winter closure or the consideration of. Um, within that, this one time is brought to you because of the timeliness and obviously the upcoming season. Um, it is staff's intent to amend the current municipal code that outlines the um, current holiday schedule, um, bring that back if, if this is permitted within that, as well as the addition of the Juneteenth holiday. So a little bit further action to be coming before you. Um, also part of it, the recommended action would be to um, current employees that are, are within the public facing, the counter facing, um, this does include that. However, certain operations that we identify here as the essential operations of the city will continue to be staffed appropriately on a rotational schedule. Um, for example, uh, certain public works maintenance or park maintenance that might be occurring, those regulatory operations that happen, uh, public safety monitoring, those sorts of things. Uh, building inspections, code enforcement on a scheduled basis will have that rotational where it's a couple of days uh, for a few staff and then it'll rotate to some other staff. Um, so we are outlining all of those schedules to ensure that those continue. And um, other than that, I will, I will stand for any questions that you might have on those notes. Questions, guys? One quick question. Are we gonna be open Friday the 22nd or closed? I wasn't sure how that We would be closed Friday the 22nd. Anybody on this side? Questions? I have a question. What do, what do, do other, how many other cities are doing this? So we did in our, our efforts of research, we do have several within Los Angeles County, um, but there's others outside of that. For example, uh, Thousand Oaks, we do have Baldwin Park. However, there are variations as to which banks are used in that circumstance. Our recommendation here is that this is a city provided closure, meaning that staff does not use their accruals. It is not a negative impact to staff in that regard. Um, so that is our recommendation here. And that varies among other cities that do recognize a winter closure. Okay, one last question. The, what is the benefit to the residents of doing this? It's a great question. So what we are looking to do here is mitigate some of the, the burnout and ensure that we're able to address some of our recruitment and retention 
um, efforts there uh, and bringing staff in, but really the, the public facing, we, we don't want any disruption to those key services as identified here as far as the building inspections, code enforcement, you're still gonna see those going forward. Um, but what this does is it, it gives staff a much needed break over, over the holiday, when we look back at schedules, we're able to see that, you know, there's a slowdown of certain businesses, so it's not disrupting what would be normal day-to-day -day during that time period. Bruce? Yeah, uh, so this is just not too far down the road from now. Um, is there already a list in place of who is going to be working during that period versus who's not? Yes, it's okay. key that we do so. Okay, so um, has there been input received from those who are going to have to work to see how they feel about the fact that everyone's getting this benefit and they're not. Yes. Um, well, and I, I will say that it's not that they're not. Um, what we're looking to put in place here is those staff members that have agreed to work, for example, if it's, if it's Tuesday, Wednesday, they're off, say, maybe the later half of the week of the winter closure. Um, we are allowing them to have what's a holiday bank so they will be able to take those hours within the fiscal year. There are certain parameters that we're placing on that, um, but they will be able to work with their supervisor and take those hours at a later time. Okay, I, maybe I didn't read that. Was that in this proposal? I believe in there. it was in the recitals. Yes, uh, item section 2D in the resolution. Employees assigned to work during the winter closure due to essential operations may accrue holiday bank hours to use ah, at a future date. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Anybody else? Marianne? I'll make a motion to... Public oh, comment, Marianne. Oh, oh any, are there sorry, any, any public comment? There are no raised hands. And we did not receive any speaker slips. Okay. That means no public comment. But, you know, the only thing I would just... We're, we're going to get more of these... But I'll tell you what, I mean, I got some calls and whether they're good calls or bad calls, Nick. But I mean, the, when we do this stuff, if we could include in that some statement that says, okay, residents, we're going to do this for our staff, but here's what you're going to get out of this, right? This is why this is going to be good for you. Uh, so, so they can at least have some perspective that uh, this isn't just a giveaway. There's really some benefit coming in the back end. So, okay, Marianne, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'll make a motion to approve Resolution 2351. I'll second it. Kelsey. Councilman Burr Riggins. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart. Yes. Councilman Burr Casanti. Yes. Councilman Burr Silverstein. Yes. Mayor Uring. Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Tell you what, guys, it's 845. We got three left. Uh, Want to take a 10 minute break? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, got four left. 850. 855. 855. Yeah. At two. See you then. We have four left. Can't talk to anybody. <laughs>
Mayor, your microphone. Helpful, yes. Okay. That's why nobody's paying attention to me. Uh, all right, guys, grab a seat. We'll get going. We're going to go to item 6C, consideration of a declaration of emergency re regarding conditions on PCH. Uh, who's going to do a staff report? Trevor? Yeah, I can give a, a short report that pleases the council. Please do. Um, before the city tonight is a draft resolution that would declare a state of emergency related to the increase of reckless and illegal driving on PCH. Oh, um, less than a month ago, the city suffered its latest devastating fatal accident on PCH and the lives of four young students have been tragically lost. The extreme peril posed by the condition of PCH is evident in the deaths and injuries that have accelerated in this stretch of road that serves as the central artery of the city. Approving this declaration will make the city eligible for mutual aid, ease procurement restrictions, and allow quicker action to preserve public safety. Under the government code, a local emergency means the duly proclaimed existence of conditions of disaster or extreme peril to the safety of persons and property within the territorial limits of a city caused by conditions which are or are likely to be beyond the control of the services, personnel, equipment, and facilities of that political subdivision and require the combined forces of other political subdivisions to combat. Government Code Section 8634 provides that during a, a local emergency, the governing body of a political subdivision, such as the city, may promulgate orders and regulations necessary to provide for the protection of life and safety, including orders or regulations imposing a curfew within the designated boundaries uh, were necessary to preserve public order and safety. Such orders and regulations and amendments and rescissions thereof shall be in writing and shall be given widespread publicity and notice. Declaring a local emergency will not give the city carte blanche to do whatever it wants, but it will potentially make action easier. Caltrans does not, uh, Caltrans does specifically have full possession and control of PCH under the Streets and Highways Code, so the city will have to work with Caltrans to make changes to PCH itself. The report contains some of the action staff is exploring, which will be presented and explained in greater detail at the PCH task force meeting scheduled for tomorrow. I'm available for any questions. Questions, folks? Do we have any uh, public speakers? Or? Yeah, these are just questions for public. Okay. I'll, go, I'll go to the public speaker. I, I have questions, but I'd rather hold them until we okay. are having our Two comments. Two public speakers. Joe, you're up first, and then Ryan. Uh, so declaring a local emergency is a good idea because CHP really is the only answer along with speeding ticket cameras to be implemented immediately along PCH to curb deaths and destruction here. Um, also the signal synchronization can have a certain traffic signals turn red when it detects speeding at key intersections where the most accidents occur such as Big Rock, Las Flores and Trancas. This will also help save some lives but not all lives. We are post fire a city of only 10,000 plus residents. We host many, many transient residents, students, hotel goers, valet parking, tourists, and SDRs, beachgoers, and MRCA visitors per year, at least 15 million. Declaring a local emergency because of the exorbitant amount of people and cars and accidents and deaths on this highway. People come through and speed on a road that May Ringe was forced to open up this joyriding highway to the state and county made to go a minimum speed of 65 miles per hour, which encourages speeding. That number should be should make it so we can make a good case to get county, state and federal monies to get CHP back at the very least. This should help City Manager McClary and Supervisor Horvath get the CHP back on PCH as soon as possible and help the amazing Captain C2 and the LASD, which we are grateful for but are too overwhelmed and stretched to take care of this alone. It is too big a highway, it's too many people on there. Um, we give the state and county a ton of income tax and property taxes so they should be able to reinstate the CHP on PCH at the very least. They come, anyway, um, these tragedies can stop with less cars and more enforcement by speed cameras and CHP along PCH. Thank you for stopping these ongoing tragedies as our city representatives. Thank you, Joe. Ryan, you're up. Thank you. I, I believe what you have before you is a very wise use of the government code. We have had an escalating problem and it's gotten out of control. The 
Folks who've been here since the 80s will remember when the California Highway Patrol was handling the traffic law enforcement on Pacific Coast Highway. And driving from this building to Santa Monica, you'd see three or four people pulled over getting a rude awakening about speeding. And everyone watched their rear view mirror and they watched their speed. The city of Malibu does not have the resources. The Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department is currently unable to provide you with additional officers. There's no other solution. So I support this 100%. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Any hands? There are no raised hands. All right, I'll bring it back. Public comments closed. Back to the council table. Comments, folks. Paul? I, I have a question that's pretty embarrassing for me to ask because I spent a lot of time on the highway. We're talking about a speed limit ranging between 40 and 55 miles an hour, and I right now can't think of a place where it's 40 miles an hour. It's a, it's a typographical error. It should be 45. Oh. Okay. Well, at least I haven't been driving inattentively for the last 45 years. Thank you. I think this is a great idea. Let's go for it. Bruce? Okay. Uh, this is the absolute bare minimum we can do. And, and I have to say, I think this is mainly words and not action. Um, I, I had proposed this um, three weeks ago now. I had asked that we actually bring it back at a special meeting. It took it took until this regular meeting to propose this, and this is not what I had proposed. It's, I mean, it's, it's the beginnings of what I proposed. The government code clearly empowers us to proclaim the existence of a local emergency if there is extreme peril to the safety of persons and property within the territorial limits of the city. There is. There's, I did some research. There's, there's actually judicial precedent for traffic conditions which cause um, serious injuries and um, death to be a local emergency, not California authority, but there's a judicial decision that supports that being a proper local emergency for purposes of the declaration. The statute says that when we declare a local emergency, we have, quote, extraordinary police powers, close quote. Um, I don't know if everyone understands what police powers are. Police powers are what all governments have to protect the um, health, safety, and welfare of the residents. They're not absolute, they're not unqualified. They are sometimes, they are constrained in certain ways. One example is state law. But this state statute doesn't say police powers. It says extraordinary police powers. The word extraordinary has to have some kind of meaning. It has to mean something above the ordinary police powers that we have. Um, when the Woolsey fire was burning and for the next two weeks after that, residents of Malibu were not, and all human, all people were not allowed to drive into Malibu. The highway was closed. I don't believe Caltrans closed the highway. So I don't accept that because the highway is owned and, ma and managed in the first instance by Caltrans, that we lack the authority under our extraordinary police powers from taking reasonable actions to protect the health, safety, and welfare of our residents when we have a condition of extreme peril. I had proposed um, two weeks ago or three weeks ago that we consider unilaterally lowering the speed limit, unilaterally in, um, putting up temporary um, stop signs or, or um, red lights, traffic signals, unilaterally putting up um, speed, putting up, putting down speed bumps that can be pulled aside, that can be pulled away and put there only during certain times when we know things are more dangerous than others. And I said there's probably a half dozen or more other things that I'm not smart enough to think about that when we put our heads together, we can all come up with. All this does is have words saying we've got a problem and we, we need help. We have a problem, we need help. As I said, that's the bare minimum, but it's not enough. Um, you know, I, I really liked Doug's idea, the, um, which he stated three, three weeks ago and he repeated today about setting the pace. Every time I go out now on PCH, I've been very consciously thinking about that and setting my cruise control to whatever the precise speed limit is. And I've got the a lot of cars now have the reactive cruise control, so it slows down the car on the rare occasion when the traffic in front of you on, on PCH is not driving the speed limit. Um, but cars are constantly driving right up to the back of my bumper um, because they're all going way faster than I am. I'm being passed constantly. Um, the majority of cars on PCH are not driving the existing speed limit. Um, but we, so we need to do things to, sh to shut that down. I'll tell you, I'd like to see residents 
in um, pairs or, or triplets actually going down the road back and forth for half hour, an hour um, in shifts, blocking the road from going above the speed limit. Two people together in tandem going the speed limit is very effective. Um, I remember one night driving on, the, on um, this is on the East Coast, on Internet, I-95, I and a bunch of semi trucks decided to stop the traffic. They all just got together and they stopped. They, they lined up over four lanes, one by one, and nobody could get past them. I never understood what they were doing it for or why they did it, but I'll always remember seeing it done. It was very effective. Um, another thing that I would like to see is literally close down lanes. You know, bring it down to one lane from time to time. We have the authority, I believe we have the authority to do that under our extraordinary police power. We also have the authority, as I said before, we can declare it a road race. We have road race statutes that give us, I don't believe we consult with Caltrans. Do we, do we have to get permission from Caltrans when we have the triathlon and the marathon to shut yes, down a lane? Yes, road races have a permit that from is. Caltrans. Okay. okay, thank you. But that, again, we have extraordinary police power. So I think we're not doing enough. I think we have to do what we're doing here, but we're not doing enough. You know. PCH is the only road that can be used to take your kids to school. It's the only road that can be used to go to the grocery store. It's the only road that could be used for you to be here tonight at the city council meeting. There is nowhere you can go in Malibu other than around your neighborhood that doesn't require going on PCH. So this is a, an unusual, extraordinary situation. We clearly have the ability to declare a local emergency. We've now been told we actually, we, we do. There was some question about that before. We have extraordinary police powers, not simply police powers. We're not exercising them. Um, notwithstanding that, I mean, I'm gonna support whatever we're willing to do. Perhaps it makes a good idea to just approve this tonight see what happens tomorrow, see if we actually get real proposals, not just talk. And if we get real proposals, push to get them done as quickly as possible. But if we're not seeing that, bring this back two weeks from now and let's start adding teeth to it. This gives us some muscle, but it doesn't really give us enough teeth. I'd like to, I'd like to see it have a bite. So I, I'll, I'll propose that we approve this tonight, but with the, under, with the caveat and understanding that this is not a final action and we have the ability to amend it and add. I, I don't want our approving this to be that we believe this is sufficient to solve the local emergency. There should be no inference that because we're approving this tonight, we've gone as far as we believe we can go or as, or, or as far as we believe we need to go. So with that, I'll, I'll, re I'll move that we approve this. I'll make a second on that, but I've got some questions that I'd like to, to raise with the city attorney. Um, and I think uh, Bruce is right. I think my comments uh, when I first read this was it was a toothless tiger because it talks about all the things we can do, but then it tells us all the places we cannot do things. So if I could uh, get some input from the city attorney who was nice enough to write this for us at our request, what is it that we can do? What is it that if we were to say tonight we want to take certain steps, what sort of examples of that or what's the parameters we can play in? So to be clear, the, the proclamation itself, just it's a requirement of law. It does make you eligible for a number of different provisions um, in the government code and other, um, and other provisions of the Emergency Services Act. And, and so it is not, you know, the, the tool to take action. It's the authorization for future actions to be taken, you know, by the city. <laughs> Um, in terms of, of, of what it authorizes you to do, it, it's broad in terms of what it does, but it is limited, you know, by our jurisdiction. And if, um, as I said, you know, Caltrans does specifically have jurisdiction over PCH, if you do want to make physical changes to PCH, it will be very difficult for you to be able to do that. It'll, it'll probably have to be re uh, the result of litigation over, um, depending what the measures are, if we're trying to do it unilaterally or something that Caltrans doesn't want to do on PCH. Or they can come through if we put up a, a, a new, you know, speed limit sign that doesn't comply with, you know, what's required to be changed under the vehicle code or um, how it's, or, or ignoring Caltrans jurisdiction, they can just go back and change it back. So, um, you know, what do you want to do? I mean, that's, that's, you know, it's hard to say what you can do and what you can't do. It comes down to specific proposals of what you'd want to do. Uh, I would recommend trying to work with Caltrans if they're able to do what we want to do and we can work together on it. That's obviously the most productive way to, for us to do it. Um, this does make us eligible for cooperation with other jurisdictions and mutual aid. It eases the procurement process. We're able to go and quickly acquire things that would maybe otherwise require bids and would us be able to go out and get work done quicker. 
um, you know, and also other types of, you know, faster action, and it empowers the city manager and um, to take actions that, you know, otherwise would, would um, not be able to be taken by him. Okay. So as I hear this, this is more symbolic, with the exception that within the city, and I'm talking about the city manager, for example, if we wanted to buy four LIDAR guns for the sheriff's department, wouldn't have to go out for bids, we could do it immediately. So the city is the one that's first and has the highest influence on this. I would like to tell the, the public that as, if we were successful tomorrow, the cooperation that we have had from the state uh, senator, from the state assembly member, uh, Allen and Irwin, and the, the county supervisor have been extraordinary. We have had excellent results with that. The mayor and and mayor and I as mayor pro temp have been working with the city manager to get many of these things done Hopefully we have a lot of success coming up But I do like Bruce's comment that we may need to come back and pull this out of our hip pocket. So with that I make the second and um, there are Further questions can I add something I, I neglected to say before just two two separate points another thing that I think we absolutely can cons have the authority to do and should consider doing is asking the sheriff's department to have more often DUI checkpoints get they shut down the highway and we could have them during times that we know are a problem um, blessing is I, I think we also should get from somebody from our staff or from somebody an analysis of how many 45 to 50 mile an hour highways have multiple driveways within a couple hundred feet of one another. People crossing the street. I, I, I can't think of anywhere else where people walk across a 50 mile an hour highway. U-turns, parallel parking on the highway, storefronts on the highway, rows of homes, one after another, directly sitting on the street, 45 miles an hour, sometimes more. These are extraordinary facts. We are a strange place. This highway was built essentially before the city was built. The city then was built, and the highway got faster as cars got faster, but nobody gave adequate consideration not to how fast can cars go on this type of a road, but how safe is it for cars to be going on this kind of a road in a city as opposed to on a true highway, which is, you know, once you get to the county line, who cares? That's that's open road. There's there are some houses, but it's open road. But this is a highway running through a city. It's absurd. And I suspect if, it, if it's not unique, it's very rare. And I'd like to understand where else people are allowed to go 50 miles an hour, blowing past people's homes, blowing past cars parked parallel on the side on the side. It's ridiculous. Anybody else comments? Marianne? So <clears throat> I read the uh, Pacific Coast Highway Safety, the PCH safety report that was created in 2015 and has a list of recommended projects. Number eight on the projects is from Webway to Las Flores Canyon. Evaluate vehicle speeds and determine if lower speed limit is warranted. Fast speed surveys in this area indicate lower speed limit may be warranted Stro Sorry, I'm a little blind and it's really small print. Um, strong public interest for motorists to slow down through this area. Slower speeds reduce the severity of collisions. Engineering and traffic survey does not appear to take speed samples, especially between Pier and Carbon Canyon, where observed speeds are slower. Um, I would recommend that that's one of the things that um, the PCH task force speak about tomorrow. That is essentially our commercial district. Um, the vast majority of our commercially zoned property is within that area. Um, I would even recommend that we push it past Las Flores and take it all the way to the eastern city limits as our request, um, given that the homes are so close together and they are so close to the street in and of itself. Um, so I think that's one thing that it's, you know, it was written in 2015. It's there. Let's recommend that one as a priority project. There's been many other items in this project uh, list that have already been started. The signal, signal synchronization between John Tyler and Tabanga. Um, this is just one more that should get elevated. Um, the other portions that I would like to make sure that we look at, I would say, 
recommend between Canaan and Trancus, maybe also do a lower speed limit area through there. That's the other section of our commercially zoned properties in addition to the amount of public open space with the beach right there and the amount of people that are parking, the new bike lanes that were installed there. Um, and I also, I don't want to forget about the Bonzel Bush, Westward Beach Road, uh, Zoomer parking lot, kind of in just area in there. There's a number of accidents that happen uh, right there at Westward and Bonzel, and I don't want that area to get overlooked. Um, and then, you know, tackle some other stuff. But that would be my recommendation that we, we set as a priority is trying to get that speed limit lowered in that one area that's already been evaluated. Um, the other thing I wanted, uh, if we could have a friendly amendment on section one of the resolution F, um, it says city officials, city staff, and city residents have noticed. I'd like to have that change to tragically aware that PCH has become increasingly dangerous instead of noticed. If that's acceptable to everybody. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Good catch. And that's. It for now. Okay. Anybody else? Doug, oh, Steve. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just responding briefly to the comments. Um, I could get comments by the council members here in terms of the suggestions on what we should be looking for. And specifically, part of our request at the task force tomorrow to Caltrans would be for them to look and see if they can uh, make the safety corridor designation for PCH. And that will specifically open up not only some funding opportunities, but would open up lane reduction, speed um, speed limit reductions for all those reasons that you just described. The uh, you know the uh, the, the proliferation of, of driveways, um, peop, the you know the, the lack of medians and the pedestrians trying to get across the highway. All those reasons, uh, I think, are very good good factors uh, for us to be able to make the argument uh, to 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 have PCH through Malibu designated as this safety corridor. It also allows us to raise the fines. That's, yes, I thank mean, you. I mean, we can make these things a little more meaningful to these people if they don't pay attention. Correct, thank you, Mr. Mayor. All the more reason for people to pay attention or visit if they can tomorrow's PCH meeting. This is, this is could be a real uh, turning point. Bruce? What, what is it, I, I'm not familiar with the safety corridor concept. What, what does that allow to occur? Sure, I don't have my, my notes in front of me, um, but um, Alexis or uh, Rob, if you could step up. I know you've been working on that. I guess we get them both. <laughs> And I think it's important not only to report what it is, but as we talked about today, uh, our traffic consultants apparently have been doing some work on this to try and qualify us. So we may be able to go to Caltrans with a statement that says, here's all the details, everything's been, you know, T's are crossed, the I's are dotted, uh, and make it easier for them to give us that, that designation. A, turn a turnkey pro request proposal from the city is hopefully in, on the way. Yeah. I'm sorry, Rob, you, yes. you guys are... You forgot more about this than I know, so. So, I can name you counsel. Uh, um, a safety corridor allows the city to, to um, put different safety features out within that section. Actually, it gives us the ability to lower the speed limits, um, double the fines in, in those certain areas. Um, could be able to get additional funding to offset um, safety, other improvements in that area. So there's quite a different latitude of different opportunities the city can get to make that corridor safer. And, and uh, um, there's there's a number of signs that we think can be placed out there that indicate this is a safety corridor um, and warns the drivers that there is consequences of, of speeding and can go over the limits. It's for double fines. So if we were inclined to do so, could we lower the speed to 25 miles an hour, for example, in the residential areas? Or is there a limit to what we can do so, in the safety corridor? So yes, there is a limit where you can do un under the state law how to lower the speed limits on a state highway uh, within that corridor. H however, there is some um, uh, language in, in the law, state laws, be able to kind of lower to where it is, uh, to lower to um, 
right now it's 45 through that section, there's a possibility to actually lower it even more. So we're currently looking to see how we can even lower it substantially more, looking for a safety corridor. We're looking at a business corridor through that area. But also what I'm having my, our consultants do right now actively is this is a residential area too. And so we're looking to see what kind of opportunities there are to do that. We have have several examples through up and down the state on Highway 1 where we identified um, state highways going through neighborhoods, going through cities where the speed, the speed limits were 35 and under. So we're looking at those opportunities and looking at those data, bring it up to Caltrans and be able to kind of present our case that Okay, great. Because you know, these, are, these, these should be lower. We, because we previously discussed. I think we previously moved to have you do your best to move it down five or ten miles an hour under some new state statute. But this is this is different. I mean, my understanding is the way they set speed limits and whether they agree to lower them is based on what the road will bear. It's not based on the surrounding area and the effects on the area. It's it's just looking at the road in isolation and how fast can cars go on this type of a roadway. It sounds to me like the safety corridor gives us an, a, little, a little bit of an ability to consider other factors, but perhaps maybe not enough even. Yeah, it, it's still, it, it's, getting the speed limits does require a speed survey out there, and, and you, could, you, you have to set the speed limits based on a, a certain procedure for the, the average speed that is out there. Um, according to the state law, but then these other factors in here, uh, um, a, a safety corridor does allow you to even lower it than what um, the state law actually makes you set okay. the speed limit. So uh, I'm not going to be able to be at this meeting tomorrow as much as I'd like to. I have to travel to the East Coast. Um, but I would hope that we request that while this is being figured out, there be emergency measures put in place with Caltrans permission to handle the situation. Let's overreact until we can figure out what the right reaction is, as opposed to do nothing until we can figure out what the re right reaction is. The other question is, the signal synchronization, maybe I misunderstand that, but I think that, I, my impression is that's gonna help people go faster, not slow people down. Yeah, absolutely not. It's, Isn't it gonna make it so that you can drive from one place to another with less red lights in the way? If you're, if you're going at a certain speed limit, which we set, so if you start at the very end, Let's say that speed limit is 40. Just for example, if you go 40 from all the way, then you'll be able to hit all the green lights. If it's if you go over 45, you're going to hit a red light. Okay, great. And, and, and so I, I just want to also point out some of the other enhancements that we're trying to do too is uh, with the with the speed radar um, cameras where we're going to a, attempt to employ those. So if someone is speeding through a certain section. It, it triggers the red light, and so it forces people to actually stop and, and do that. And then have a red light enforcement cameras, so if they do happen to read the red light, they can, they'll get a ticket that way, too. Right. Oh, go ahead. Uh, two quick questions or a uh, quick comment. One of the things about this emergency action that I like is the fact that we are going to allow the city manager to have the latitude if you need to spend money for a consultant or to speed something up, he doesn't have to come back or look to his budget. He can uh, take the emergency actions to get that done. That's a real positive for us. That is not superficial in, in my estimation. Second question is, when we talk about this uh, speed corridor or business corridor or whichever one it is, give me an idea of how far this extends through the city. Obviously, it probably starts at the eastern city limits. How far does it go to the west? So, so we're doing that analysis now. State law dictates kind of the length and of what you can designate as a safety corridor, and, and we're looking at that. Um, yeah, yeah, at the top of my head, there there is a there is a length, uh, a maximum length of the roadway. You can make that dis distinction. So, so we're looking at different options, and maybe there's an option to do a safety corridor in a lot of this in majority of the section on PCH, but there maybe there's another section where we can do as a business. Maybe there's a residential. And so we're looking at all the different options that we can maximize uh, the designations within the city. With this emergency ordinance, then you ought to be able to go uh, throttles up and get it done. Anybody else? 
Questions, comments? I have another question. <clears throat> um, so with both the emergency that we're contemplating that the city attorney has written and the safety corridor, are there time limits on those um, that we have to renew them or that they will expire? Yes. And what are those? Every 60 days we'll have to renew this, the uh, declaration of emergency. So okay. Kelsey will calendar that. It'll just come back as a regular item just as we were dealing with uh, winter and the Woolsey fire. Okay, and then I'm just looking through, because at the end of this table, they go through and they rate and give a score to every proposal, and they have different criteria on it. And the criteria were um, institutional issues, complexity, and the final score. Um, and one of the things, the... Webway to Las Flores reduction in speed. I think it had a four as um, four out of five as being recommended, and um, really the only negatives were just the change to the community and how they might accept it. And given everything of the last ten years, it would seem that the sentiment has changed um, to be encouraging that we move on this faster than slower. So I would really look to the this safety report and try and adhere to it as much as possible. Anybody else? I agree with Bruce's original comment that said this past this, this may give us additional leverage when we sit down and talk to Caltrans tomorrow. Right? I mean having this in your back pocket is not going to hurt us. So have we had a motion to Approve this already? We've we got a second? Motion Let's call Kelsey, motion. give us some roll call, please. With Count changes. With the friendly amendment yeah. accepted by the maker and the seconder from Councilmember Riggins. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Mayor Uring? Yes. Motion carries. Very good. This will be helpful. Okay, moving right along. Item 6D. Consideration of a gift of Smart Coast California membership fees from Council Member Grisanti. Uh, can I bring up a question on this? He sure. may have to recuse He's himself. He's got to recuse himself. Yeah, but it, it, can we talk about the first, the uh, 7A first and then do. Uh, I'm going to have to recuse myself. Six, I, I mean, if, if we don't one, I don't, I don't know, if it makes a difference. Well, he, he can talk, he can stay for one of them, can he? Uh, yeah, he, he uh, my recommendation is that he recuse himself from the item considering whether to accept the donation of the payment. So um, it would probably make sense to hear the item about whether the count, whether the council wants to join Smart Coast first, which he can participate in. Um, if the council decides not to uh, participate, then there will be no need to, have to hear the second item. Um, if the council chooses to join Smart Coast, uh, then um, I would recommend that Council Member Cristante uh, recuse himself from the consideration whether to accept his donation. Bruce? So, yeah, so um, one, we already approved the order. Um, two, I believe that having done that, it's now in the discretion of the mayor whether he wants to propose a change. But m most substantively and not procedurally, I, I think that's an end run around the recusal on item 7 um, or 6D, because if Paul can participate in the discussion of the benefits and detriments of it, he's already discussing the, sec the other issue, whether we should join it and whether he and whether his um, membership, whether his donation should be made. So I think we should stick to the um, direction that's already the order of the um, agenda as it exists, have the discussion of 6D. And that might obviate the, the need for 7A altogether. That's, that's my take. I mean, if they, we don't do 6D, 7A is not going anyplace. Why? No, because yeah. that, that would just be the donation. If you don't accept the donation, you could still join Smart Coast. Um, it just means that you would not have it paid for by the council member. And the council does have the ability to amend the ag agenda and the order the items are heard by a majority vote. Can I correct an error in 6D? Before I recuse myself, with Trevor, with I'll make a motion to reorder the agenda and put 7A before 6D. I'll second that. Do 
Do we all vote on that or yes. does? Yes. Okay. Yes. Can we call the question, Mayor? Yeah, Kelsey. Well, Count. We can have discussion. Oh, excuse me, <laughs> Bruce. Would you like? To, yes, go ahead. Okay. So, so for the reasons I already stated, I I oppose that motion. I, I have a problem with this concept that a city council member who's a member of an organization can bring forward a discussion of whether the city should join the organization, full stop. I, I think that if any other council member wanted to make that proposal in the first place, they could have, but I do not believe that any one of us who's a member of an organization, much less either the existing president or the outgoing president or former president, um, ought to be proposing that we hear from an organization as to whether we ought to be joining that organization. I don't think they should be getting the airtime to discuss their organization in the absence of someone else having proposed it and a majority vote excluding the, the member of the council who's a member of that um, organization. I suspect Trevor's going to say there's no FPPC violation, but it still seems to me it smells. It doesn't pass the smell test. It may pass the legal blush test, but it doesn't pass the smell test. I don't think we should be hearing either of these, much less with Paul on the dais. So I'm going to vote no. I'm going to vote no. I, I agree with you. This is, you know, it's back, in, and I said this before, the ethics course that I've taken, and I take, I've had a bunch of them now since I've been here. If it looks bad, don't do it. Right? It's the perception in the, in the residents that makes a difference. It may be okay, but if it looks bad, it's, it's, not, gonna, it's not a good thing to do. So I'm, I'm going to vote no also. I'm confused. You're voting no on reordering the agenda, or you're voting no on item 7A and 6D? Reordering the, I'm voting no on reordering the agenda. But that's what the motion is, I think, right? Okay. Same here. Can we have a roll call to make this official one way or the other? Kelsey? Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? I'm going to vote no, but I have a question of legal counsel. Um, is a motion, what is the vote required for a motion to reconsider a prior decision? Is it a 3 2 or is it a supermajority? To reconsider? Yes. Motion to reconsider. I believe it's just a majority. You believe it or it is? I would, to, I would have to check. I believe it's a, I believe it's a majority. Okay. No. no. Mayor Yuri. No. Motion carries. This is only for, for the order of March. That's all. So now we're going to hear item 7A. So I guess we're going to do 7A. Uh, and who's going to present this one? We have with us today Marta Golden Brown, the CEO of Smart Coast California. Marta was one of the founders of the organization. She came, she and uh, Krista Pleisner came up with the idea and uh, spread it. And it's now throughout the state of California. Uh, she also her heralded us, led us through the transition from a 501c6 to a 501c3 that was accomplished this year. And uh, she just today presented a copy of the municipal collaborative, I'm sorry, the planners compendium to members of our planning department. Uh, Richard got a copy as well. And please tell us about the organization. Well, thank you very much, Mayor Uring and City Council Member. I appreciate the time uh, to spend before you. I am Marta Golding Brown. I am the co founder and CEO of Smart Coast California. And I wanted to provide you a little background on what Smart Coast California is. I did provide you all with an email last week giving a little bit of the background. Um, Smart Coast California was originally established as a 501c6 organization in 2019 to promote and advocate for smart land use policies affecting the 1,271 miles of coastline. 
The organization was recently granted a 501c3 status by the IRS as our mission was closely aligned with a mission of education and information sharing more than pure advocacy. Smart Coast California is dedicated to community sustainability, property rights, and the environment. The organization was established by 27 coastal associations of realtors to educate communities about sea level rise, their local coastal plans, and subsequent amendments. The Smart Coast California Board covers the full state of California and has one non-realtor member on our board in 2023 and will have two non-realtor members in 2024. We support property rights in the coastal zones and support communities who wish to implement a tiered response to rising seas. These are our policies. We have, exist we have a policy on each of these uh, existing development, managed retreat, regulatory takings, a tiered response, and rolling easements. Smart Coast California supports utilizing the best available science and planning documents and decisions for coastal management. We support utilizing a tiered approach that supports monitoring actual sea level rise, uh, shoreline changes, and planning according to those observations, as opposed to relying on just simply projections. Smart Coast California also supports the avoidance of regulatory takings without just compensation. Smart Coast California has held two educational policy summits in 2022 and 2023 on coastal issues, providing a platform for coastal experts to discuss the various options available to communities for addressing sea level rise. Attendees receive presentations from scientists, planners, and attorneys to understand the Coastal Act, pending cases, and the best available science. Videos from our summits and a wealth of additional information is available to you on our website. I hope you will review what is there to further understand our organization. We have attended the California League of Cities two years in a row, uh, and we participated in the most, most recent California League of Cities conferences, and we also pre were present, uh, represented at the most recent American Planning Conference. We have con ongoing staff communications with, uh, and consultants communicate with long local planning staff members to monitor sea level rise planning activity, to share our policy summit information and provide resources to, uh, about what other jurisdictions are currently com completing. We track uh, local coastal plan amendments statewide excuse me, statewide, and the progress of the LCPAs under review via our critical engagement spreadsheet. May I continue? Uh, time's up. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Any raised hands? So one raised hand from Howard Rudsky. Howard, you're on. Mayor, we have some speakers who submitted course uh, speaker slips for 6D who seem to want to speak on 7A if you'd like to consider hearing them after that confusion. Yeah, that's a okay. problem. Never mind, we have the speaker slips, I'm so sorry. Okay. So let's get Howard on, he's already on line, let's get him in. Am I unmuted? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Okay. My question to everybody is, why wouldn't we want to be associated with a group that could help us with coastal and sea level rise? It seems that we need all the help we can get. We don't have to accept their advice or help, but at least we can get it and then deduce for ourselves if we like it or not. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, I've got two speaker slips, one for Jill Drummond. <laughs> And Norm, you'll follow Joe. Hi, so this is not an environmental group. This is a lobbyist group. We have many scientific studies already completed on sea level rise. This one from May 2023 states the shoreline where the water meets the sand right now is probably going to retreat landward about 30 meters or more for every meter of sea level rise you get. This was Sean Vitusek, a research oceanographer at the U.S. Geological Survey and lead author of the report by the Journal of Geophysical Research, Earth Science. 
Observations of historical shoreline position obtained from satellite images can be used in lieu of traditional shoreline survey data to estimate erosion accretion trends as well as to calibrate and validate models. By 2100, this model estimates that 24% to 75% of California's beaches may become completely eroded due to sea level rise scenarios of one to three meters, respectively. The city's own coastal hazard vulnerability assessment completed in August found that waters could rise 2.5 feet by 2060 and 6.6 .6 feet by 2100. This will create potential erosion and flooding risk for Pacific Coast Highway and other infrastructure, according to the report. Many of the narrow beaches along the Malibu coast will disappear with sea level rise impacting shore ecology and recreation, the report reads. We need solutions on how to reverse climate change, not to arm our oceans and beaches unnaturally or artificially to protect homes that will be doomed either way unless we can lower the Earth's temperature and not have it keep rising from our irresponsible human activity. This is a lobbyist organization and the city should not work at cross purposes with shoreline retreat and for shoreline armoring, etc. This puts the city in direct opposition with the Coastal Commission and coastal zone conservation efforts and we cannot and should not go there. This organization represents the interests of realtors and developers and not the environment which the city should be aligned with and do everything we can to reverse pollution, beach and ocean armoring and development, etc. And from Craig Hill's email, in light of the recent FPPC concerns, it would be prudent for Councilmember Grisanti to be recusing himself from any decisions that might involve subject matter that Smart Coast California deals with, such as an appeal of an application for a project on a beach parcel. Arguably, you should also recuse or at least make explicit disclosures on any matter for which organizational partner Don Schmitz has appeared before a city decision-making body. They are partners on this organization and obviously have more of a conflict of interest than anything either the two either the two are involved in bringing the city council to city council bringing this to city council is a conflict of interest and I don't even know how you have the audacity to bring this to council and not recuse yourself when you are president of the organization or were or whatever and that you're trying to support as a city get the council to support as a city and a lobbying group for real estate and development it's absolutely outrageous and I I hope the council doesn't put themselves in a bad situation thank you Joe Norm? Uh, good evening again, council members, uh, Chair Uring. I have attended most, if not all, of the Smart Coast California meetings. And I'll try and make it as simple as I can. It's about information. It's about information that, that coming from all different areas. My background is civil engineering, but I'm not a geologist. I'm not a coastal engineer. I'm not many of the professionals that show up at these meetings and make, uh, provide information. That's what these, that's what this organization is all about. And with information, we have options. There are all kinds of situations up and down the coastline, not just in California, but throughout the world. And this organization brings those options, which many people haven't even considered. You know, one of the things I tell people I work with is sometimes the very best alternative is the one that we haven't thought of yet. The organization is geared to and committed to providing options. You know, it's not just about armoring. We don't armor all the coasts. There are certain coasts we allow to simply erode away. Then we have federal uh, transportation corridors, rails, that need to be protected. We have PCH, which is one of our primary defense corridors protecting the West Coast. Are we gonna let that go away too? Are the environmentalists gonna say, we don't need to protect it? We can protect it. I don't know all the ways which we can protect it, but there's got to be four or five, and it's up to us to recommend those, the, the one that is best for the environment and the one that provides our protection for our country. It's not made up of a bunch of lobbyists. It's made up of a bunch of professionals 
that know their business. They don't know all. That's why we want everybody to join in. I've learned a tremendous amount by going to these organizations and these meetings. Thank you very much for the time. Thanks, Governor. Are you a member? I am. Thank you. Uh, any other hands, no hands? Brian, I got no slip, Brian. Any, Brian, any? Brian had his hand raised in Zoom, but he's here too. Brian, you not, we're not going to play. You want me to do it on the phone? Otherwise, there's no other raised hands. I've raised Make my hand on the phone. Go ahead, get up, just do it. You're not gonna, we're not going to play that game, though, Norm, uh, Ryan, so be aware of that. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I sat here for the whole thing, and I submitted a slip Ryan, for this item. Oh. I submitted a slip for this item. I don't know where it is. It's 6D. So um, the, the organization is great. That's fine. But the city needs to have its own advocacy and be in control of it independently and not just join an organization because you're lending your name. And it gives credibility to the organization. They're, you're raising hundreds of thousands of dollars, and yes, they're a lobbying organization. So it does not mean you cannot work with them or partner with them in some other way. There will obviously become things to which the city does not agree, particularly with the interests that are uh, supporting the organization. So at some point you will diverge and it's going to be awkward if you're a paid member or somebody paid your membership into that organization. But by all means, the city needs to advocate for its own position using its own lobbyists when it needs to do so, especially before the Coast Commission and the Coast Commission staff and not just join in on a group for a big effort. So, um, Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other hands raised? No, there's no other raised hands. I've got no other speaker slips. We're going to close public comment, bring it back to the table. Comments, guys. I have a comment. Bruce? I believe this item was just to hear what was just presented, so I suggest that we move on to the next item. Well, I have questions I'd like to find out the presentation. Uh, I think there's things to learn from this. I think the, the item also includes whether to join the Smart Coast Municipal Collective Group. So it's not just to hear the presentation, it's to determine if the council wants to take an action to join. Now you've got a question, answer your question. All right. Um, first question I've got is, who else is a city member? Is this something that other cities have joined along the coast or not? Who can answer that? I, I guess maybe we need the director up here. The city of Oxnard is currently a member and there's a water district from uh, the San Clemente area who has joined recently as a member of, and we have one planning group, uh, a set of planning consultants who have joined because what was in the presentation, sorry that you didn't get the rest of, um, it talks about the collaborative is, is letting the planning planners working on these issues come together in meetings and share information of what's working on the coast and what's not working and be able to make better decisions collectively as a state. I okay. think the answer was one, one city, right? Yeah, it sounds like one city. All right, uh, so the other question I've got is, if we join, what's different about the information we receive as opposed to if we don't join? And what I mean by that, it seems like our people are, have access to the information already and are participating in the meetings, right? They, <clears throat> excuse me, they attended the summits, uh, so they had access to the meeting that occurred in the two policy summits. There, they have access to what would be considered maybe an executive summary of the compendium, but they do not have the deep uh, access to the to all of the material in the planner's compendium. Okay, but it's not copy. They could they could get it from somebody else, right? Or is it copyrighted? or limited distribution? It's limited distribution. Okay. Um, what, it, what is it that, what's the advantage of us joining, I guess is my question. What is, what Collaboration is it? and communication, honestly. That's what, that's what this organization is about. It's about collaboration and communication so that cities are making decisions 
that are wise for their communities and their cities and as a collect collective up and down the coast of California. Okay, and then the last question I've got, um, 501c3 designation says you're not supposed to be a lobbyist. That's correct. Uh, how are you guys avoiding that? Uh, I've had several people say that you're a lobbyist. Uh, how, you, how did you manage that with the IRS? So it was, a, we thought we would end up being considered a lobbyist organization. That's why we incorporated it as a 501c6. We were in um, business, uh, basically, and what we discovered is it was all, for us, it was more about information and the policy summits, and we are not the ones that are advocating and we're not lobbying. So um, when we really looked at that and we were talking to our attorneys, they said, why are you a 501c6? You really need to be a C3. So we went through the process with the IRS, had the full IRS review, and we were granted a C3. So um, we are, it's about education and collaboration and assisting local jurisdictions to make good coastal decisions as they're going through their vulnerability studies and their local coastal plans and amendments. Thank you. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Anybody else? Sure. Uh, one of the things that was said was that Don Schmitz is my partner on this. Don is not a partner. He's not an officer. He is somebody we hired. And we hired him out of the people who applied four years ago because he actually had people going to meetings up and down the state and he had a better awareness of what is being proposed in various other jurisdictions than someone who just works in our jurisdiction. And one of the most valuable things in that uh, planner's compendium is the fact that planners can look through that and see where other people are in their local coastal plan update process and talk to other people who are at a similar point or a little bit ahead of us and see what's working, what isn't working, what Coastal seems to like or not like, and figure out how to do that. As far as uh, the only solution is to do managed retreat, it's not the only solution. There are, it, there's an amazing amount of underwater reefs that are currently in place up and down the coast, and those help maintain sand in the same place. Uh, you may know that the uh, L.A. County Board of Supervisors is now pushing a project. Uh, they didn't get the NOAA grant, but they've gone back, and they're going to continue with their process of trying to do an underground reef and do shoreline nourishment with the, pro with the uh, material from flood basins that would, if if Los Angeles wasn't here, the material in flood basins would have gone to the sea, which is where sand comes from. And that, that is a normal process. That stuff that eroded from, from the mountains in the San Gabriel Mountains wants to make it to the sea and become sand. So we, we want to help them achieve that sand's goal so it can live out its life as it's supposed to be. The other thing I wanted to mention is there's a mistake in six in the one I'm going to be leaving for, in that it says I, my, I offered to do it as long as I was a city councilman. I didn't. I said as long as I'm employed by anyone. So until I'm on Social Security and that's it, I'm going to continue to give $1,000 a year at least to Smart Coast California. And if you guys can get a benefit out of it, that's great. If you don't want it, that's great too. Thank you. I've, I've got to, I just, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, okay? But well, just where you are, you're not, I don't think you're going to have to correct me. Uh, I took a look at your website, okay? All of your members are primarily real estate people, and I couldn't find any notice that any one of them had any kind of a degree in oceanography, in, in climate change, in anything, right? So the... the your group is not necessarily providing the information. You're going out to talk to other people and getting their opinions, and we can do that on our own. I mean, I don't know why, why I've got to have you tell me what Joe's saying, if I can talk to Joe and get the information from him directly. Second thing is I can't find any evidence that the Coastal Commission has taken anything that you guys have recommended 
and adopt it as one of their policies. Okay? And I think no matter what you guys say, I mean, when put for the city's perspective, we're going to listen to the, we got to listen to the Coastal Commission. Right? We're, I don't want to start a fight with them, so we're going to listen to what they say. If you guys got something different, unless you can convince them that you're right, uh, I don't think it makes a difference. You might be interested to know that Kate Hucklebridge, who's the current executive director of the Coastal Commission, has uh, attended our most recent the question thing. Is, and wait, wait, but Paul, you're, you're changing the topic. No, the no, I'm is, answering did your they, question. Did they adopt anything you guys have put together? I think that there's a reason that she and her top staff are meeting with us on a quarterly it's, it's basis. A yes or no question. If the day of, have they adopted any of the policies you guys have put forward and said, yeah, we're going to do what you say? Actually, what they have done is back away from managed retreat as the only solution. They have done that. Okay. They have, but they haven't adopted any of the policies you put together. Yes or no? They have I mean, adopted several policies and approved several projects that we were reported on at the summits. So those projects were not coastal armoring projects. They were projects to replace the uh, eelgrass. Those kind of things were reported on to us. All of those things help. There was a, policy, a project that UCSB just did at, at uh, Santa Monica trying to find out why the dunes can't come back. Well, the dunes can't come back because we, we've got people out there with machinery raking the sand all the time. Which, which, kills, which one of your members that, that are on, on your website decide, came up with that conclusion? We didn't come up with that conclusion. We, ah, we okay. collect information and distribute it. Did you know that? Yeah, I do. Okay. Bruce? Yeah, we live in a world of disinformation, unfortunately. You can't, I mean, it, it's getting to the point where you can't believe anything you hear, read, or even see. This, and, and on the, also, Malibu is a valuable name. It's an important name, it's a valuable name, especially in the area of environment. So here we have an organization founded by and driven by realtors who have an agenda. Nothing wrong with having an agenda. Nothing wrong with being realtors. But they're realtors and they have an agenda. And the agenda is not necessarily neutrality. It's an agenda. It's a biased agenda. It has a, um, it has a goal. And the goal is not to do necessarily what is right. The goal is to do what is best for the real, for the real estate community. Um, Joe made the point that um, the only way, at the end of the day, that, we're all, that, we're, we're, that this planet is going to continue to thrive and support people and other, and other life as we know it is if we put an end to climate change. I, don't have, no, I have no clue how that's going to happen. But urgency creates innovation. And finding ways to put a Band-Aid on the problem so that you don't have to, you can ignore it and not be urgent is not the way to solve the big problem. And that's what this group is about, finding Band-Aids that will help the real estate community until such time as there's a cure, or maybe who cares if there's a cure. It's not science. It's, it, is, it may not be technically lobbyists, but it is a biased organization that has an end game. The very fact that Norm is here speaking in favor of it, Paul is speaking in favor of it, Don Schmitz is um, a paid consultant of it, should tell everyone everything they need to know. One of the things this organization supports, if I read their, their, their literature correctly also, is to um, secure legislation that would require compensation from local governments for enforcing their zoning laws in ways that will, uh, with, with respect to homes on the coast. So they're asking every one of you to fund the um, damage that might be done for people that live on the coast who, did, who bought based on making bad decisions. Um, so we're asking, we're being asked to join an organization which is going to, which is promoting imposing a bill on our city. There are a lot of good written comments that were submitted to that nobody's discussed. I actually was tempted to just read them into the record, but I'm not, I'm not going to do that. 
But um, and, and again, I think it's an abomination that the president or the outgoing uh, Paul, what are you, the president currently or the former president? The new president has been elected in the, the meeting between See the outgoing president. There's, there's a joint meeting that happens in December where they will take over and I, I leave. So, there, so it's an abomination that the president of this biased organization that that favors the real estate industry is sitting here proposing that we join this. So I'm going to vote against it. OK, I, I prefer to think of it as a, a most a group that supports coastal residents. Anybody else? Okay, um, I'm probably going to maybe regret saying this, but um, anyone who is arrogant who thinks that we are going to do anything to stop climate change, we can be absolutely better stewards of our environment and make better decisions to ensure that we are cleaner and more environmentally sensitive, but climate change is going to happen. It has been happening since this planet was created, and you can look at that in the plate tectonics and the different um, polar ice caps and everything else, and it, you know, as we're discovering different things, it's going to happen. Um, with regards to this organization and only being for realtors, I find issue with that because it's the proper, private property owners that are ultimately going to um, have to deal with the effects. Now, whether they we leave them to do that on their own or collectively we help them as a community and as a city and make decisions, I think that's something that we need to decide, and that's one of the things that we're elected to do up here. Um, I think just we can see that the Coastal Commission and other scientists have come forward with specific solutions that they feel are the right things, and then other scientists come up with different ideas that give merit to different ideas. Um, and there's not a one-size-fits-all for the state, let alone our city. If you look at the east end of those homes that have been there, Lloyd, how old's your house? 60 years old? It was built, no, my house was built in 1980, but there's a lot of houses that are real old. 40s, 50s, 60s? Yes. And then you go up coast and you've got homes that are, you know, maybe not directly on the ocean. So even within our city, there's going to be different solutions for the different problems that are going to occur. Um, you know, we're even sponsoring a program on Westward Beach where we're trying to do a dunes restoration program to try and recapture sand. And the county is trying to do another project to try and recapture sand. Um, it's been pointed out that even within our own community, all the erosion control measures that we've put forth and the Coastal Commission have mandated is depleting the ocean of materials for sand. And we need to be looking at those sort of types of things. Um, I'm going to be on a more practical, and I'm sorry if I'm putting the city manager on the spot here. Is being a part of this going to help our employees? Are they going to help our planners, our coastal engineers, to make um, a, give them additional resources uh, to help them do their jobs and make recommendations to the city? Be honest with you, I really haven't given much thought to that. Um, I mean, it could, but I, I would suspect that we could we would probably be able to obtain that information elsewhere. So, I mean, I think if the city joined, there would probably be some benefit coming back to the employees, but I really haven't given it too much thought. I don't I mean, think anything it, that we can do to support our staff, I'm in favor of. Um, but if it's a kind of a neutral um, option, you know, and and the, the the council members that may oppose this, I would just ask: Are you doing it because of who's bringing it forward? Or are you doing it because that the group really isn't something that is worthwhile for our community to be involved with? I'm doing it because this, Malibu has got a, a name, and that name is worth a lot of money, and that name is also 
influences other people in terms of what they do. Uh, and I can see giving Paul the use of our name will be a huge benefit to their organization since they've only got one city as a member right now. I'm just going to make one correction on this. This isn't to Paul. This well, is to Paul, Smart Coast Paul, California, well, well, and that's what the point I was trying to make. I don't interrupt you. I, I don't interrupt I'm you. I'm just clarifying. I don't interrupt you, okay? He uh, to Paul. Paul's the president, and it said, okay. Uh, so I do believe that this is a big benefit to them. I, I I'm diff have a difficult time trying to figure out what the benefit is to Mel. Uh, and, if, I mean, if, the, if anybody wants to come in, I mean, Paul's, the other piece is for a thousand bucks, I'll pay a thousand bucks, and you become a member. I mean, so can organizations come in here for a thousand dollars and say, I'll give here's a thousand bucks? I want you to join my organization so I can use your name also. I mean, this is crazy. This is crazy. You know, we're supposed to be protecting the, the assets of the city, and the, the name Malibu is an asset of this city. And if, if, to give it away is the wrong thing to do. And also wouldn't sell it to, the, to an organization. But, so I'm, I'm opposed to this for the reasons I stated. The fact that Paul's proposing it is just like cream. It's, it's the uh, icing on the cake. Um, I will say it's I'd like to know the answer to this. It sounds to me like I'm hearing from Mary Ann that humans are not causing climate change and that humans can do nothing about it. D did I understand that correctly? No. OK, so, so the fact that it's been happening off and on for years, hu we're, human race is contributing to this problem and the human race can contribute to the cure. And as I said, finding ways to band-aid the problem and help the most wealthy members of society avoid the effects of it is not a way to help cure it. It's a way to help stem that cure. Who are those wealthy members that you're talking about? The property owners that along the coast? Among others, yes. Well, go ahead. I, th I think that one of the basic, I, I uh, first came to Steve with this at last April uh, when I decided to make a gift to the association, to Smart Coast. And the benefit that I offered to him at that point is that uh, it would come with a ticket to the summit. And uh, the previous summit, there were two planners from Malibu who attended and got continuing education credit from the APA, which is the American uh, Planners Association. And I went to him and said, I, I want to give a gift to the city of Malibu, which comes with a ticket so that you don't have to pay for someone to go there. They will, they will have one ticket anyway. And uh, you know, it, everything seems to take a long time, and the, we had people from Malibu go to it this year as well, and the city of Malibu ended up paying for them. But, you know, if you guys are happy sending people to it, and they're, they're going to get their continuing education credits, which they earn, then that's fine too. But, you know, it's, this is not... Well, that's it. Yep. Okay, let's let's uh, be realistic about what we're facing with here. I, and I agree with Mary Ann. You're not going to get a solution to climate change in 50 years or 100 years. And you hear people talk all the time about we've reached a tipping point where we can't recover. So to some degree, we're going to have to live with what we got. And uh, whether Joe is correct in her two meters or uh, in depth, two meters in depth, by the way, of additional uh, ocean rise would mean our feet would be wet almost at this point right here. We would be underwater. The city as a whole is a coastal city, and we have to learn how to deal with this uh, ocean rise, whether it's one foot, three feet, six feet, whatever it's going to turn out to be. And you have to realize, too, that there's already been a lot of disagreement about just how fast the ocean is rising, but there is a uh, pretty steady drumbeat that it is rising. So the more we have information about how to solve that problem for our residents, the better off we are. 
Now, the one thing I was pressing on when I was talking to the director is, what do we get out of this for our city? And Mary Ann hit on it too. What do our planners get, planners get out of it? And Paul was right. I think if our planners go to the meetings, they get continuing education. That's what this is about. Learn what the options are. Learn what learn what the best ideas are. And I agree with Norm. The be, you, you look back at uh, scientific uh, breakthroughs are quite often the ones where nobody believed they were they were right until they tried them. So we don't know what the answers are for some of this until we get there, and the sharing of knowledge is critical. I think the best way to handle this from my standpoint, and I'd like to make a motion on this, is we uh, certainly appreciate the uh, uh, opportunity here with Smart Coast uh, uh, California, but let's postpone this and review it in a year to see what the uh, benefits are to the city at that time. We've got access to the information already, Let's uh, postpone a decision on this. And also the fact that they just became a 501c3 as opposed to a lobbying organization, I think means that we need to let this season a little bit too and make sure we're not supporting a lobbying group. So I'd like to make a motion that we postpone this decision for a year, come back and take a look at it, but encourage our, our planners as, as worthwhile to attend the meetings and get the information. I'll, I'll second, second the motion. You can second it, Marianne. Um, I just want to clarify something I said before, um, just the point that Marianne's question about am I saying that people who live on the coast are the wealthiest people? We're not talking about just Malibu. We're talking about the coasts throughout the entire globe. I mean, th this whatever proposals are being made aren't being made specific for Malibu. They're being made at a minimum for the entire state of California. They're being made as a – they're part of the story for the world. There's no question that the top 1% live or have homes on the coast. They all do. Most, um, I, I, I doubt that there's a single person among the, among the billionaires in the world that doesn't have at least one coastal property. The state of California has, what, 2,000 miles of coast, 1,000 miles of coast, 15, 000, 1,500 miles of coast. 12. All of that coast needs to be taken into account and when you find, again, when you find ways to avoid confronting the big problem, you don't have to confront the big problem until all of a sudden it's too late. Maybe it is too late already, but finding ways to um, deal with the situation as opposed to change the situation is a guaranteed way of not changing the situation. Kelsey, roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart. Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Gasanti? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Uring? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. Let's go back to 6D then. I think we can uh, drop. Huh? We're not joining, so there's no need to donation. Yeah, it's been mooted since okay. there's. It, you can, if you want to take official mean, action, you can continue, postpone it to the same date. So what do we have to do with it tonight? I'll make a motion to postpone 6D for one year, similar to 7 I'll, I'll second that motion. Kelsey? Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? He can't vote on this one. Yeah, he should not vote on this one. That's <laughs> Councilmember Grisanti abstains? <laughs> he shouldn't even be sitting here for it. It's the rule. We're, we're just continuing the items. He doesn't... Six, seven, six, D, D as in dog. being postponed for, for uh, to be heard at the same time as 7A in a one-year period. If I could start that roll call over again, Councilmember Riggins? <laughs> yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti, you're abstained? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? No. Mayor Uring? No. Motion care. I'm sorry, we had two uh, yeses yeah, and fails, one abstention. Yeah. Motion fails. Motion fails. Motion fails. Motion fails. fails. Then All right. So what do we do with this? Just, just done. Nothing. Well, there's, there's, the, the motion was to postpone it. So the motion's still on the, on the agenda tonight. So then I guess we hear the item. <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean we hear the item? You guys voted not to postpone it, so 
It's well, to, I think we already had the vote. The vote was not to postpone it. Well, I'll make a motion to remove it from the calendar. We have another item. One more item. So I'll make a motion that we remove item 6D from the calendar. Paul, you want to withdraw the, your, your motion? You want to withdraw your offer? That'll sell. I've already spent the money, and I'm going to continue to spend the money every year for as long as I'm working for a living. Not here, but I, across the highway. Look, okay, here's the... We, we could continue to a date uncertain. I, I'm moving that it be removed from the calendar. That might fail, but that's my motion. We earlier had a motion to, re, to, to reorder the calendar, so this is another motion with respect to the calendar. I'll second it. Or the agenda, rather. Kelsey, roll call. So this, this is a motion to remove it completely. Remove it from the agenda. Yeah. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti, you're abstained? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Mayor Uring? Yes. Motion carries. All right. Glad to get that one over. 7B, proposed calendar. Uh, Kelsey, you're going to talk to us about this one? Yes, there isn't too much to report here, but we have prepared your calendar of meetings for the next calendar year. We did check and we do not have any conflicts this year with Rosh Hashanah or, or Yom Kippur, but we do have a couple of conflicts with uh, holidays recognized in the Malibu Municipal Code that will push your regular meeting to Tuesdays. And then the only other thing to note would be the strategic priority meetings we have scheduled. The exact format is still being determined, so we would ask the council members to keep their days and evenings open on those dates. Those are, special, those are listed as special meetings? This includes all your regular meetings and then our pre-planned special meetings, which include two to discuss the strategic priorities of the city and one for your budget workshop. Um, additional special meetings can and I'm sure will be scheduled as needed throughout the year. Gotcha. Do we need a motion? Um, Mayor, just if I can file. note, we don't have any speaker slips for this item, and we don't have any raised hands in Zoom. Okay. I'll make a motion to adopt the proposed calendar for the 2024 City Council meetings. I'll second that. Kelsey, roll call. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Gasanti? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Mayor Yearing? Yes. Motion carries. We're adjourned. Thanks, folks. Oh.